Welcome to the first episode of Irish Radio Plays. We start with first false impressions by Kevin McKean. The story stars Donal O'Kelly as Jimmy Hazard, a private eye on the prowl, and Joe Taylor as the snap shooting snoop. Surveillance is itself under the searchlight in this keystone caper. Featuring Jennifer O'D, Deirdre Monaghan and Jack Lynch. Hey, Jill. What's up? The big boss man paying us a visit. Send him in. He's on his way in now. He looks raging, Jimmy. Heads up. Thanks, Jill. Let me know when Mrs. James arrives. Jimmy, I need a word. Mr. Hardis. Yeah. It's rare seeing you here at the agency. Uh, what can I do for you? Tell him back the condescension for one. I'm not one to beat around bushes at no time. So I'm cutting straight to it. I'm not happy. You look stressed, all right. Caseload is down, along with our client roster, not to mention our profits. I know. But the fact is, we can't manufacture clients. They either want a detective or they don't. That's not the point, Jimmy. The fact of the matter is, your team just isn't justifying itself financially. With all due respect, Mr. Harris, two employees run this agency on a dime and our expenses have never gone over budget without compensation from the client. You've got an assistant sitting out there five days a week. Jill is our name. You ought to know. You hired her. Don't get smart with me, Jimmy. What does a detective need an assistant for? To hold your magnifying glass? Why don't you run me through it? You have no idea how far out of line you are. The work that woman does is invaluable. She's a meticulous researcher. A shrewd communicator. She performs background and data checks we can't manage when we're in the field. We? You and that photographer of yours? I heard he was a pervert. Snoop is not a pervert. He's taken a few topless pictures for the tabloids. He's a freelance photographer. Not to mention, he's only hired on contract on a case-by-case basis when we need his services. And do you expect me to believe you can't walk a camera by yourself? Ah, I told you all this at the time, but I'll repeat myself. I can't guarantee quality pictures, which means the agency can't guarantee reliable, irrefutable evidence to our clients, which means they don't pay us, which means the reputation of the agency is made questionable. I haven't even gotten to you yet, Jimmy. Glad to hear it. Your performance is under evaluation as well. I've received information recently that casts you in a different light. And you've got a file on me, have you? Well, please, fill me in. Where did you get this information? I've got me sources, Jimmy. I have a whole list of them myself. Why don't you just tell me what it is you're getting at? We don't hear from you in weeks, not even a phone call or a word of warning. Then you come in here angry and stressed and start threatening us. What's going on? Look, bottom line, we need to turn a profit, Jimmy. Fast. And you lot have to prove yourself sharp or I'll have to make changes. Changes that affect our jobs? Exactly. Well, I've got a client due in, so if you just get out of our hair, I'll be able to get some work done for you. Two days, Jimmy. That's how long you have. For what? To close this case. Wednesday morning, I want it wrapped. I don't even know what the case is yet. I'm only meeting the client this morning. Well, if you're half the team you say you are, two days should do it. And I'll be watching you every step of the way. Will you? Between trips to the bookies, is it? That's nothing to do with this. Don't get personal. This is business. I'll tell you what. Come in on Wednesday morning. Case closed. We give you the final report. Each team member fully justified. We all keep our jobs. Deal? Look, Jimmy, there's other behind-the-scenes stuff going on. The lease is up and money's tight on paying it. Oh, I'm sure your sources will come up with something. I don't care about your lease. I care about our jobs. And I don't appreciate how you've come in here and handled this situation thrown around ultimatums out of nowhere. Look, it's bad all over, Jimmy. I don't have to explain myself. So if I bring in this case, our jobs are safe. Is that what you're saying? But can you guarantee that? Jill, what's up? Mary Jane's here for the point of Jimmy. 
One second, thanks, Jill. Now, can you guarantee that, Mr. Harris? If we take this case, bring it in and prove our worth, can you guarantee our jobs? I need a straight answer here. Fair enough, Jimmy. Deal. Get it done, do it well. We'll meet here Wednesday. Send Mrs. James in. Thanks, Jill. Now, if you'll excuse us, boss, we have a case to close. Mrs. James, how are you? Jimmy Hazard, private detective. Come on in. Mr. Harris was just leaving. I'll call tomorrow for updates. Ah, sure, you'll be watching us, remember. So long, Mr. Harris. Sit down, please, Mrs. James. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hazard. <laughs> how are you? I'm sorry about all this bother. No bother at all. We're eager to help you, Mrs. James. I believe you're concerned about your husband. Uh, Frank, yes. We've been married 26 years, and they've all been happy years. I'm a bit nervous about all this, to be honest. I never did anything like this before. There's nothing to worry about. Can you tell me about your concerns? Well... Frank has worked nine till seven for years now. Gets home at about quarter past seven every night for dinner. And where does Frank work? Oh, he works in HR for Huxley's Financial Advisors. As long as we've been married, he's never been late home without letting me know. Or so I thought. There was never anything out of the ordinary that I knew of. That's the routine of our life, Mr Hazard, since the kids left. Then last week, I was in town with a neighbour of mine one Thursday evening, not too far from Huxley's, and it was around ten to seven, so I decided to drop in and meet Frank at work. (laughs) With a young woman at the desk. Well, she says Frank only works till six. He always has, she said, and he's never in past the hour. She said you could set your watch to Frank leaving at two minutes to six every day without fail. Well, that was last week. Now, I don't know what to think. And have you spoken to Frank, Mrs James? Tried to wean some information out of him? I don't know what to say to him. I don't want to start fighting if it's nothing. He's retiring this year and we're planning going away for a few months. He says he can't wait and, oh... Neither can I. And I don't want to ruin anything if there's nothing the matter. But still, I'm worried. And I want to know what he's been doing with that hour. And why he'd keep it a secret. Is there anything else, Mrs James, that might seem out of the ordinary? Oh, not that I can think of. I'm sorry. That's no problem, Mrs. James. Now, now, have you a picture of your husband? Some information, like Jill would have asked you to bring? Mm, it's all there in this envelope. The picture is a year old. But he just has less hair now. OK, Mrs. James. Here's what we'll do. I'm sending you back out to Jill in a minute, and she'll give you the forms to sign once you're agreeable. Mm. Myself and my colleague will follow your husband over the coming days and find out what he's been up to. I'll let you know immediately as soon as we find anything. Thank you. All right, Jimmy. Jill, can you run through the forms with Mrs. James here in a minute and get Snoop on the phone, put him through to the office? Yeah, no worries. Send her out to me. Thank you. I go out to Jill, so. We'll talk soon, Mary. And leave your mobile number with Jill and keep it on you for the next few days. Thank you, Mr. Hazard. Uh, yeah? I'm up. Snoop, it's Jimmy. We're on today. Harris is on the warpath. Get your camera locked and loaded. I'll we'll pick you up at five. Will do, Jimmy. See you then. Detective Jimmy Hazard with resident photographer Gerald Snoop McKenzie. Case number K1047. Observing evening routine of one F. James. It's three minutes to six on Monday the 24th. What's that? 
Did you buy a dictaphone? I'm recording everything, Snoop. Oh, Torres as always, Jimmy. You're a detective's detective. If Harris wants documentation, I'll bury him under it. What was Harris saying? He said we've two days to close this case or he's making changes. Two days? It's a bit random, isn't it? And what did Jill say? Well, she's raging. Out of the blue, he lands in running the muck. He was acting weird, Snoop. I never seen him that angry before. He stressed out over something. He said he got information on me that cast me in a new light. What info? You're cleaner than most whistles, Jimmy. I don't know. Sounds like someone has his ear and they're talking money. That's about all it takes to get his ear. Does he still think I'm a pervert? Yeah. What else is new? I do two page three shoots and the boss is crying for a conviction. Sure, if he paid me more money, I wouldn't have to do them. I have to eat. And then he said the lease was up and he's getting second thoughts. Maybe if he spent less time in the bookies. I told him that. He's never out of the place. Anyway, what's the story here? Who are we scoping? Mr Frank James, I told you. Here, Jill has a file cooked up already. Mm. Uh, works in the Huxley building there. His wife is concerned about where he's been spending his evenings. He's had an hour off work for 20 odd years that Mrs James didn't know about. Another affair? This where people are busy beavers, aren't they? But we don't know it's an affair, Snoop. It's always an affair. 90% of the time, at least. Whether it be husband or wife. I've taken enough pictures to back up my theory. I know, but we haven't confirmed it yet, so don't jump to conclusions. Just let's see how it plays out. Get your camera ready. So he's due out any minute. What does he look like? The picture's in there somewhere. Ah, yeah. <laughs> he's old enough. Doing well managing an affair for the baldy lad. That's an old picture. He could have less hair now. Oh, there he is, Jimmy, Jimmy. Look, look. Shanda now the hooks he's now. I'm glad I brought me zoom lens. F. James has just left the Huxley building on Enway Road, his place of employ. It's 6 p.m. on the dot. He's heading for his car. What's that? Uh, it's a Nissan. An Almira. We're off. Going east on Enway Road. He's in a rush, isn't he? He's turning right up there. What's that, Dunwich Avenue? Yeah, Dunwich, taking the middle lane, going straight. He's already looking suspect. How come? Because he lives in the opposite direction, Snoop. His estate is not too far from the agency. He's on the mooch, Jimmy. Sure, I told you that. I say we snap him and his mistress today and be done with it. Get proof and go straight to Harris. We might even get a bonus for getting the job done early. I doubt there'll be a bonus, but... That's the plan. Is that his indicator? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going left onto the Selby Road. That's where all them cafes and restaurants are. There's, there's about 12 of them. There was. A lot of them are gone now, closed and sold. That's still a few left. He's pulling in there, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. I see him, Snoop. I'm going the opposite side. Do you want him to make us? <laughs> Mr. James is out of his vehicle on the Selby. He's locking up. Oh, this is pure scandal waiting to happen. I'm betting we're going to catch these pair of adulterers at it now at carnal lunch. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. He's heading for Benedict's Cafe. He's checking his watch. Running late. He's just entered Benedict's. He is sitting in one of the window booths. Ah, oh, perfect. And it's a table for two as well, Jimmy. A boot can fit up to four. He's giving his order to the waitress. It's 6.13 p.m. Jimmy, what? You're not going to believe this. Check out the boot near the back, near, near the counter here. Here, try the zoom lens. Four rows behind Mr. James. Look who it is. Who? <gasps> Mr. Harris, the boss man himself, dining in Benedict's. Who's that he's having lunch with? That's, uh, that's Charlo Lonergan. He's always in the bookies yammering. Don't know who the younger fellow is, though. Him and Harris think they have the horse game sus the way they go on. Didn't think they were that friendly, though. They're usually arguing or trying to outdo each other with their racing knowledge. Mm, that's a pricey suit Lonergan's got on him. Yeah, he's not usually dressed like that. What does Lonergan do? Ah, oh, talks crap in the bookies, I told you. Don't be asking me how he butters his bread, I don't know. So much for Harris keeping watch on us. Uh, here we go. Case K1047. 
F. James has just been served in Benedict's Cafe. Looks like soup. No sign of the mistress. What's that he's taken out of his pocket? It looks like a bit of paper, Jimmy, and a pen. Huh? He's scribbling something. Huh, maybe she's running late. He looks a bit sus. He's putting the paper back in his pocket, looking around. What's he doing? He's calling the waitress, Jimmy. Could it be the waitress? That girl's about 20, Snoop. I don't think they'd let her serve hot food if her eyesight was that bad. He's paying the bill, Jimmy. And he barely even touched the soup when he's off. She look, the bowl's still steaming. Mrs. James said he was always home for dinner at around a quarter past seven. Maybe he's saving room. But why order then? Why bother? He was stood up, plain and simple. I didn't see him check his phone. Mr. James has left Benedict's. Give me that bike. He's getting into his car. 6.18 p.m. He's off again. Quick, Jimmy, Jimmy. He's turning back down Dunwich Avenue. Oh, don't tell me he's off home. She stood him up, I told you. Hold up. He's veering off Dunwich, left onto Winslow Drive. Oh, that was a sly move. Winslow, that's a ghost to stay down to the end. Where's he going? It's getting pitch dark. Turn off the lights for trailing him up there. He's slowing down. You are right about the ghost town. I reckon he owns one of these houses. He's stopping. Slow down, slow down. Turn off the lights. I know how it's done. I've given courses on stakeouts. He's just exited the vehicle on Winslow Estate. 6.23 p.m. Ah, he's gone out of view. Right, Snoop, you're on foot. Follow him and I'll watch the car in case he rambles back. Find out where he's going, what he's doing, and don't get mad. Right, will I bring the camera? Well, that would be ideal. I'm all over it. Goodfellas Detective Agency. Hey, Jill. Did you check out that lease situation? The lease isn't up, Jimmy. It was about a month ago, but Mr. Harris signed and paid up there and then. He has the place another ten years. But at least we have him caught in a lie. Well, we may have to call him on it soon enough. So what are you going to do? I can't afford to lose this job, Jimmy. I'm already cutting hair part-time as it is. I'll think of something, Jill. I hear Snoop back now. now. Don't you worry in the meantime. Talk to you in the morning, Jimmy. And don't tell Snoop about my hairdressing. <sighs> Jimmy, he's dodgy. This fella is dodgy. What happened? Well, I couldn't make it out, but it was dodgy. Hang on. There he is. Get down. Watch him. He's on his way back to this car. F. James leaving Winslow Drive at 6.30 p.m. He's on the move. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's gone. What did you see? Well, I walk around the back row of houses in the laneway. There's this row of storage units, like, like, like huge lockers. Now, by the time I got there, all I heard was him closing one of the shutters. I saw him walking away. He looked dodgy, Jimmy. Plain and simple. Y you didn't spot which locker or what he was doing? Look, I told you, he was already closing it by the time I got there. I just missed him. But he was obviously putting something in. Or taking something out. But did he spot you? No way. Ninjas couldn't catch me tonight. No sign of the mistress, then? We're dealing with more than mistresses here, Jimmy. Where's he off to now, do you think? Takes about 40 minutes to get to his house from here. I reckon he's heading home. Let's make sure. Uh, that dictaphone is beeping red, Jimmy. Look. Uh, here, I'll turn it off to save the battery. This is Detective Jimmy Hazard, re-case K1047. I don't know where this case is going. Our two-day deadline is looking impossible at this stage. We're going to pick it up in the morning. Get a line on the storage unit. Over and out. Get down to the bookies as soon as you can. What time is it? It's only 11.30. 
11, they've got a contract. Yeah, and the contract employees are always the first ones to go. This is our last day to crack this case. Is that Jimmy? Yeah, it's Jimmy. Does that mean I'm fired a day earlier because I'm on contract? You will be if you don't get up now. Get down to the bookies and suss out how Harris's look has been. What do you mean his look? Well, see if he's been talking up any horses or playing any long hands. Whether he's broke or flush, I'd use your head. Right, right. Well, I try and suss Charlo Lonergan. Suss everything. Charles Lonergan is a member of a syndicate with a few horses. He's got land in Newbridge. I'm going down to suss the place now. Get any scoop you can. Buy it if you have to. I'll give you the money back. Then meet me at half five at F. James's job. And we'll track him to the storage unit and end it. All right? Snoop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm up, I'm up. Do it now, then. Keep me updated and don't be late. Detective Agency, good morning. Jill, how are you? What's the latest? Grand, Jimmy. Just got a chance to look into that mail you sent me. I don't think we've any hope of tracing a written agreement regarding the rental of that storage unit. The lot's abandoned. No doubt he rented it when things were flush. Mm. Or he found it and threw a padlock on it. I was out there this morning. I have it narrowed down to three units. The rest are open and in disrepair. Can you, uh, can you do me a favour and look into one Charles Lonergan? We saw Harris eating with him at Benedict's last night. Snoop says they're both never out of the bookies, and they weren't really friends until recently. He's an owner and has a couple of horses, a few wins under his belt, if the papers are anything to go by. Lives local, but he's got a stable out in Newbridge. Can't seem to get much else on him. Seems fairly new on the scene. I'm going down to check it out now. No bother. I'll get on to Mrs. James as well. Ask her if she knows anything about her husband's interests in any storage units. Sure, if worse comes to worse, we can get her permission to access it. Uh, good thinking. How close are you to solving this thing, Jimmy? Well, once we find out what's in the lockup, that's it. Well, we'll get him tonight. What's he up to then? I don't know, Jill, but it looks bad. Be careful on the phone with Mrs. James. I always am. Well, we don't want her getting the wrong idea before we know what this is. And we don't want her to ask him any questions and alter his pattern. Here, I'm off up to Lonergan's place. Grant, talk to you when I find something. Case K1047. Jimmy Hazard here. I'm outside the Huxley building. F. James is due out of his office any minute now. It's 5.57pm, Tuesday the 25th. No sign of a snoop. If he's still in bed, I'll kill him. Snoop, where are you? Relax, Jimmy. I'm pulling in behind you. <sighs> you took your time. I was snooping, like you told me. Don't park. You head down to the Winslow Estate and get a good spot so we can ID this locker and get a few snaps. Let me know when you're there. No, it's okay, it's okay. We'll stay on the line, Jimmy. I've got three calls. Well, what did you find out about the boss man? Tell me you went to the bookies. I was born in the bookies. Of course I went. No winners, though. Uh, never mind your accumulators. What did you find out about Harris? Well, pickles were slim. Then I ran into Dame O'Bolger. He's a better than gambler down there. Oh, you probably know him to see. Big mop of dyed hair that you can see straight through. Hang on, Snoop. F. James has just left his office building. Six on the dot. He's heading for his Almira. Go on. Well, Damo said three weeks ago Harris was in the old punk bar, mouthing on about a long shot coming in from a 66 to 1 off a major tip. F. James has just taken off, turning onto Dunwich Avenue. Go on, Snoop. Now, Damo Bulger is not one to pass up the chance of some insider info. In fact, he strikes me as the sort that actively seeks him out, so we pressed Harris for specifics. Harris gave him nothing, saying it was too lucrative an opportunity just to hand out to anybody. That's if it was a tip, says Harris. Though Damo knew well it was. 
too lucrative an opportunity. Now, that's a direct quote. Did you get the horse's name? No, Harris said nothing. But Damo knew that the only long shot in that week with 66 to 1 odds was Gambler's Fortune. <gasps> Gambler's Fortune? Owned by one Charles S. Lonergan. Damo knew well, Jimmy. So he asked Harris straight out if it was Lonergan he got his tip off. And he walked off. Not even blinking, Damo said. He said he's seen him around since, getting lunch with Lonigan's son, Philip. That's how we must have seen with them and Benedict's last night. Harris is not here this evening. I've just parked on the far side of the Selby Road. Benedict's is empty. F. James has just parked. He's on foot, passing Benedict's. Jimmy, Jimmy. One thing at a time, Snoop. It's 6.15 p.m. F. James has just entered the Tall Stop Cafe, headed straight for self-service. Setting for disaster. I'm at the estate now. I'm parking down at the end of a cul-de-sac out of view. What's he doing? He's hovering, looking around. Looks like he's getting... Sue. If it wasn't for that locker, I'd swear he just hates his wife's cooking. So what did you find out on Harris? I went down to Lonigan's stables, took a few pictures. Well, what are you doing taking pictures, Jimmy? That's my job. Ah, you can't be two places at once. I needed you with the bookies. So you sent me down to fish for info where no pictures were required, and off you went down the country with a camera. Now tell me how that looks, Jimmy. Well, no one's after your job, Snoop. Calm down. I'm sure my snaps will pale in comparison to any you would have taken. Oh, too right they do. Look, can I finish? I took a few pictures of the thoroughbreds in action. Lonergan and the train are running them out. There was nothing unusual until I got back and went to lunch with a contact of mine in Irish horse racing. He owes me a few favours. So I got him to fish whatever info he could on Lonergan, strictly off the books. I explained our job situation. Yeah, we're desperate. There's no shame in it. Mm. He says Charles Lonergan's syndicate have four horses registered with the IHR. And their official trainer is Brian Kilban. Hang on, Jimmy, hang on. What's Mr James up to now? He's sitting in the Tall Stop Cafe drinking his soup. I'm watching him. Don't worry. All right, all right. I'm scoping a spot here at the storage unit on foot. Go on. So, once I got this info, I already copped. There was something wrong at the stables. I said nothing to me contact in case we land Harris in it. I'm working under the assumption Mr. Harris is unaware of any suspicious behaviour. Not at all, assumption. I went back to the office and I start looking more into it. And what was wrong? Hang on, Snoop. Mr. James has just left the Tall Stop Cafe. He's moving fast for his motor. Jumping in. If he drives straight down here, it has to be drugs he's into, Jimmy. It's either a pick-up or a drop-off, I'm telling you. He's swinging a U-turn, turning north onto Dunwich Avenue. So, what was wrong with Lonergan? Well, first up, the trainer I snapped this morning looks nothing like Brian Kilban. He did look, however, like Morgan Grimes, a rogue trainer with more than a few accusations of doping, bribery and race-fixing in his wake. So, Kilban is vouched as trainer... And Lonergan has Grimes working his magic behind the scenes. It's looking that way. On top of that, Lonergan was running eight horses this morning, four at a time. IHR has no registration on four of these horses, and there's no mention of Lonergan buying them in the racing rags. Ringers. In this day and age. Could be. I'll send you the pictures. All horses look alike to me. Jill checked out Morgan Grimes and Brian Kilban, and neither has publicly declared buying any horses recently. The syndicate? They're just not saying. Well, let's not get lost in this thing. We just have to prove to Harris there's enough muck to make them dirty. James is on Winslow Drive now, Snoop. Are you hidden? As well as I can be. I can see his lights. He's parked at the turn. Same spot as yesterday. Yeah, he's getting out, Jimmy. Here he comes. Is he around back yet? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's approaching the lockers. Shh, shh. Uh, Jimmy Hazard here, case K1047. He's reaching for his keys, Jimmy. Strolling towards the lane right now, looking around. Good work. Snap him, Snoop. He's at the lockers. Door one in. What's he waiting for? Shh, shh. He's looking so Jimmy. He's looking around. He's opening it. 
What number is it? I don't know. What have we got? That fish in here. Pulled one in. What's it? What's in the locker? I can't see. I'm at the wrong angle. Oh, well, why didn't you get a better angle earlier? I'm in the hedge here, Jimmy. It's a laneway. If I tried blending into a wall, he'd make me straight away. That was the only cover around, and it's not ideal. All right, forget it. What's he doing? Oh, he just pulled something out of his jacket pocket. What? Phone? It's a knife, Jimmy. What? It was definitely a knife, Jimmy. I saw the flash. What's he doing with a knife? He's gone inside the locker now. I'm at the far end of the laneway now. I can see the open locker. Here he is. He's back out. He's slamming it shut. Stay hidden. Yeah, I'm hardly going to go out breathing now, am I? Oh, he's coming my way. On his way back to his car. I'm at the locker. He's at his car now, Jimmy. He's getting in. I'm on the way. What was he doing with the knife, Jimmy? It's 6.23pm. F. James has just drove out of the Winslow estate. He's out of sight. I don't know about this, Jimmy. Why does an elf lad need a knife? Come here and hold this flashlight, Snoop. Now, which one is it? Uh, here, this one. Standard enough padlock. If someone's locked up in here, I'm blaming you. If there's someone locked up in here, that'd clearly be Mr. James's fault. Ah, you know what I mean. What are you doing down there? Picking the lock. Mrs. James gave me the go-ahead. Done. Uh, that was disturbingly quick, Jimmy. Yeah, I used to be a magician. Oh, now, don't start. I wasn't a very good one, but I had a way with locks. Well, shall we open this shutter, Houdini, and make this case disappear? Jimmy, what is all this? <laughs> At least it's not drugs. Or people. Yeah, but, but, but this is just ridiculous. I know what's going on. Just take pictures, then we'll close this thing. But, Jimmy, who does that? I mean, seriously. And all labelled. Look at these ones. Jimmy, look. Look at this one. April 6th, 1992. The Gresham. This is something Frank James has been hiding for years. Hey, Jill, we're in the middle of something here. Can I ring you back in five? No, no, this is important, Jimmy. It's Philip Lonergan, Charles' son. He's a certified private detective. Uh, not a very good one, obviously, or we wouldn't be four steps ahead of him. Great work, Jill. That's not the great work. He's also the owner of four prized thoroughbreds, not currently registered with the IHR. Uh, we're wrapping up one case, and you've just wrapped the other. What's she saying? Lonergan's son owns the horses. Whoa. Where would we be without that woman? Uh, Snoop senses tanks, as always, Jill. I'm booking Mrs. James in for 10 a.m. tomorrow. Get Harris in for five past. I'll brief him on the James case, then I'll grill him. If you don't, I will. Talk then. Do you know what's going on here, Jimmy? Because I don't. Help me close this thing. And let's get out of here. On the way. Uh, Mrs. James, come on in. How are you? I'm grand. Now, you go ahead, take a seat. How did you get on with Frank? I've taken care of our arrangement. What is this? Now, this is going to come as a shock to you, Mrs. James. But hear me out and you'll see it's not as bad as it looks. Well, how bad does it look? First of all, Mrs. James, I have to ask... Have you ever heard of kleptomania? It's some kind of disease. It's an uncontrollable compulsion to steal. Oh, what has Frank been thieving? Well, I, I wouldn't go so far as to call it thieving in the truest sense of the word. Was he robbing the post office? He's always swearing blind against the post office. No, it's nothing like that. Look, Mrs James, we followed your husband to the storage unit Jill told you about. Mm. But when he left, we gained access and found thousands of items. Oh. Pens, pencils, 
staplers, forks, knives, spoons, <sighs> salt shakers, lighters, shot glasses, you name it. <sighs> all tagged, labelled with the date they were taken and the place they were stolen from. All arranged in chronological order. It's meticulous. This, I'm sorry to say, fits in with obsessive compulsive disorder, another symptom of kleptomania. I saw a documentary about it. Here's the pictures of the stolen items. Sorry, I, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything, Mrs James. Least of all, apologise. But can I tell you, it sounds to me like Frank has it under control for the most part. He has a system and no one gets hurt. But, but all the stuff he's taken... And that's twice this week he's been at it. But it, it could be getting worse. That's true. What you do with this information is your choice, Mrs James. Approach it whatever way you want. And you can keep that file. Why wouldn't he just tell me? Well, he probably felt ashamed or embarrassed. Then so long past, he couldn't tell you. First of all, we're taking it all back. But what would the police think? Uh, judging from the labels, most of the establishments he's stolen from are out of business anyway. Ah, for God's sake, Frank. You could return the items, but I don't think showing up at their door with a few spoons will brighten their day somehow. He never singled any one place out, from what we can tell. We're talking a few cent here and there that no one missed. What am I supposed to do? Uh, here's a bit of information on kleptomania, if that's what it is. The names of a few councillors. Oh. Maybe you can talk to them, figure something out with Frank. I'll have to speak to him, won't I? Oh, I'd say so, but try and take it easy on him. <laughs> Once he comes clean, I will. Is this enough for you then, Mrs James? It's plenty. Oh, it's not as bad as I thought. I'm not telling you what I thought, but it's not as bad. Do I pay you here? Uh, Jill will take care of you, get your receipt. Thanks, Jill. Jimmy. Uh, one moment, please, Mr. Harris. Uh, Mrs. James was just leaving. Mrs. James, this is Mr. Harris, the owner of Goodfellow's Detective Agency. Oh, hello, Mr. Harris. Thank you for all your hard work and for being so understanding. Oh, uh, it's uh, no problem, Mrs. James. If I wasn't keeping all of this a secret... I'd be recommending you to all my friends. Now, take care, Mrs. James. Now, that's all sorted. <laughs> Mr. Harris, how are things? I trust you heard the good news. Another case wrapped. Another satisfied customer. Don't make a drama out of this, Jimmy. Show me the file before we jump the gun. Did you not make your own with all the surveillance you had on us? Don't be at me, Jimmy. I'm reading this. Take your time. It's all there. Needless to say, there was considerable overtime involved due to the time restrictions placed upon us. Seems to be in order. It's a little bit too clean, if you ask me. Too clean? Not something you or Charles Lonergan would know about. What? What do you know about Charles Lonergan? More than you, I'm willing to bet. We saw you with him in Benedict's the other night when we were tailing Mr James. Check the photos. Him and his son, Philip. Yeah, we were eating, so what? I mean, it's been a few weeks since his outsider tip came in. You can't all be still revelling in it. You must be planning your next step. These accusations won't be without consequence. We're horsemen. Lonigan gave you a solid tip with Gambler's Fortune. Or was it his son, Philip, the certified private detective? You're out of line, Jimmy. I'm way off track. The fact is, I can't afford to be taking things lightly when I have this lease to think about. You have another ten years to think about the lease. What? We have our sources too, Eddie. Don't play us on this one. I'm asking you now. You have the lease. Why are you lying? I'm not planning anything. Do you or do you not have the lease? Of course I have the lease. And you're planning to replace me with Philip Lonergan? I'm weighing it up. Due to business opportunities the Lonergans can offer. And what are they giving you? Good tips. One so far. Two winners so far, Jimmy. Oh. Pincher's bicep, I made 6,000. And then Gambler's Fortune comes in and that's two he's got me. The results. The man's an expert for God's sake. And where do these tips come from? From Lonergan. And how does he get them? 
The man's an expert. I told you. He has four mares of his own. And what does he have you do for the honour? I don't have to answer any of this. If our jobs are on the line, then we're owed that much. Why don't I tell you what we found out about this whole escapade in the few moments spare between closing the James case in record time? Ah, you're going to enlighten me now, is it? If you're not beyond this, Charles Lonigan has four horses registered with IHR. He's filled me in on all that. So you also know Philip Lonergan has four unregistered horses out in their stables. What? Philip owns four mares, and they're all dead ringers, Eddie. A double for each horse registered. Check the photos. They're groomed to be identical. They're out there running four at a time. No one's stupid enough to fall for a ringer. I know. That's why they're going to get caught eventually. But they fell for it so far. When was this picture taken, Jimmy? Yesterday, between jobs. So, Lonergan has Gambler's Fortune, Pincher's Bicep, Willing a Win, and Goby's Choice. And the trainer nominated on all four of these horses... Brian Kilban. Charo told me that. That's how I knew it was legit. I saw the forms. So, what's Morgan Grimes doing down there, training them? Morgan Grimes... He's a rogue trainer with a bad rep. I know Grimes, and if I'd have known he was involved... He was out there yesterday, Eddie, laughing it up with Lonigan, running the nags easy, pushing the ringers hard. There it is. Snoop took them. This is sickening to me, Jimmy. Morgan Grimes cost me 722 quid back in 07 on a sure favourite with his doping. Look... I don't know exactly what they're all up to, but they're dodgy. And there's no reason you should be associating with them if you really love your horse racing. Forget all that. I'm not joining the syndicate with Morgan Grimes. Ah, so that was it? They offered you membership? They said if I played along for a while, worked their system, they'd let me in. They wouldn't have let you in, Eddie. Lonergan Syndicate has had six membership changes in under three years. I hate order very particular about how many changes of memberships occur in a registered syndicate. And my source says Lonergan's is in the red. So I was being had, plain and simple. <sighs> Charlo gives me a list every week, tells me to bet X amounts on these particular horses, then he gives me an outsider, one of his own usually, and the haul outweighs what I spent. Minus their tipper's fees. Uh, he has you manipulating the odds and paying them for the privilege. Then, come race day, they have a crew of suckers out, like yourself, betting on random nags to dupe the odds. Look, it can only last so long, though, Mr Harris, and that's only two days of looking into them. And Philip Lonergan seemed like such a nice young man. Uh, on a related note... Philip Lonergan's PI licence is under investigation after allegations of misrepresentation since July last. The case is pending early next month. Jesus. What dirt did he have on me? Huh? Ah, nothing. No, tell me, what was it? Ah, he said you didn't pay your TB licence last year. Ah, that was a misunderstanding. That's long sorted. I, I know, Jimmy, I know. Look, I, I was dazzled by the promise, OK? I've three other businesses on the go, and I, I can't stay out of the bookies. I was trying to merge me two loves. <sighs> I just wish you came to us sooner. I mean, you run a private detective agency. I know. I was taking this place for granted. Willing to sell you down the river at Lonergan say so. Stupid. Uh, how could you know? I'm sure they've swindled countless others. What about Lonergan? You want to confront him? Get deeper into this? No, but he still expects me to follow his lists and put money down for him, for him giving me gambler's fortune. Tell him no. And if he starts on about it, hand him this picture of his doppelganger horses as a last payment and make sure to tell him it's only a copy and there's plenty more. That'll shut him up, all right, I'd say. And uh, what about our jobs, Mr. Harris? Now we're finally being honest. Get the others in here. Jill, Snoop, come on in here for a minute. Jill, Snoop. How's it going, boss? Mr. Harris. 
take a seat. Uh, I just wanted to say that you all did an excellent job. There'll be full overtime on this James case, and I'm keeping you all on. Thanks, Mr. Harris, but uh, can we get that in writing? <laughs> That's fair enough after the way I've been acting. Uh, I'm sure you're probably all on edge. Uh, I'll get on to it immediately, and you'll have it at the end of the day. We give you two days. It's only fair. Cheers, boss. Yeah, nice one. That's all we needed. Well, that's the case of the missing jobs solved. I leave you to it. Uh, Mr. Harris. What is it, Snoop? Uh, I was just going to ask. Huh? Can I get a lift down to the bookies? She's Not Mine by Rosaline McDonough. The story of a mother and the daughter she entrusted to an institution in the week that falls between the Feast of the Annunciation and the floral bouquets of Mother's Day, Rosaline McDonough's play for radio explores the maternal bond and the maternal bind in the relationship between a single mother from the 1970s and the daughter she entrusted to a state institution. Jane is my secretary, a lovely young one with great potential. I told her to clear the diary for the next few months because I'd have to do a particular piece of work, stressing that it was strictly confidential. She laughed. She thought I was covering up for the minister, that there was some big scandal afoot. In the middle of her smirking and laughing, I had to check her. She was taken aback. I said it was serious. Back in my office, I shut the door. The files were open, but I couldn't even bear to start reading. Down in the canteen, people were looking at me as if I got a promotion. Some big job that I should be delighted with. I didn't tell anyone how much I was dreading what they were asking me to do. 24 years in the service. Seven promotions. I was top of my game. It was no surprise to anyone that I got landed with reading the files. Others would make notes, but I'd be asked to read the most severe abuse cases. During those months, my world got smaller. The worry became bigger and bigger. The possibility, my fear, it just seemed to take over. Clarity had left me. Conscience had given way to confusion. That night, I finished work at seven in the evening. The files were piling up. Each case was more horrific than the next. I went into a pub and ordered a brandy, then another. What I read during the day, oh, I just felt my stomach open, of children being starved, being beaten, raped, and God knows what. The men in the office were trying to cover it up in a subtle way, of course. They were talking about what might happen if all the allegations were true. The financial implications. The government and church. The media were on to us as well. Mel's order was implicated. I arranged to meet her before she had a chance to start putting in calls. Vera was like that. She'd used the civil service, her position, to intimidate my secretary. The refusal by her to come to the convent made me nervous. I asked her if it was a conflict of interest, us meeting, what with the inquiry and all. She snapped, it's not about the job and you know that. That shut me up. This woman. I'd known her all my life. Normally I could predict her reaction to anything I said or did, but this particular day there was a different tone to her voice on the phone. She was making demands on me, letting me know she was in charge. While I was getting ready, I made speeches up in my head. Things that I've wanted to say to Vera. But I suppose I knew she had the upper hand now, and she was loving it. Oddly enough, I'm not saying I felt afraid or guilty. I had nothing to feel guilty about. 
That's what we told each other. Those of us that were still alive. All I'm saying is that when it's someone you know, there's a different form of guilt. There's a different form of resentment. Then I thought, just for a second, I just thought... Vera, let's put our money together and just go somewhere. Take me away from all this. Be the friend to me that I was to you. <laughs> Softness wasn't part of my makeup. Pulling myself together, reminding myself it was only Vera Murphy I was meeting. Who was she anyway? My brain was always bigger than hers and she knew that. Deciding what to wear, the thought struck me that we had a strange friendship. It wasn't built on kindness or mutual respect. All oh, that's too modern. That's not how we were reared. I suggested a hotel, but no, she wanted a pub after work. I'd say it was either before her first brandy or else she was building up a thirst. That's another thing about Vera. Her drinking. That's what has her the way she is. I suppose what else does she have? Though we all tried to tell her to move on, she had plenty of opportunity to get some man to marry her. But no. She was happy to live in her own misery and blame it on other people. She hid behind that job, thinking people didn't notice, or the odd glass of wine or sip of brandy. Sure, a woman like her needed it, holding state secrets in her briefcase. Now, with my coat on, heading for Dublin, Vera Murphy was the first one who made me realise it might be some time before I could wear a habit in public. Others had stopped wearing it many years ago. But I liked it. The power and prestige. In recent years, well, I, I have to admit, people didn't hold their counsel or even hold the door open for you. But the habit, for me, whether they respected, rejected or hated me for it, when I didn't wear it, I felt naked, invisible, like I was no one. On the way to meet Vera, I pulled the car in to get petrol. <sighs> the oddest thing, I found myself hiding my cross inside my clothes. <sighs> the headlines on the newspapers, the radio talk shows, where do you hide? I kept thinking, if she got drunk enough, maybe she'd mellow. Slip up on something and tell me what was to come next. What the powers that be were planning. But not Vera Murphy. All she wanted to know was what I had done to Caroline. I asked her, should she not be concerned about all the children? It was in that sentence that I realised this woman was out for revenge. She asked me specific questions. I told her, you're not in a position to judge me. Again, she kept using the phrase, my daughter. I told her she didn't want her daughter 30 years ago. She would have happily killed it if it wasn't for me. Both of us knew our voices were being raised. I told Vera this wasn't the place. She said there was no place anymore for me to hide. I reminded her I hid her 30 years ago for six months when the bump started showing. She couldn't go back to Sligo. I told her mother, Avir is busy with work. She can't come home this weekend, Mrs Murphy. None of this mattered now. Vera was on a roll. I told her, you can say what you like. Nobody wanted those children. We fed them, watched them and reared them. She turned to me, eyes blazing. What else did you do to them?
What was so difficult about meeting in the convent? You're lucky I'm meeting you at all. These days, you're not the most popular woman to have a conversation with. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? I know everything about you, Vera Murphy. And soon the world will know everything about you and your secrets. Me and Vera Murphy relied and depended on each other. Holidays. Well, I'd no one else to go with. And it wasn't as if she had a whole lot of friends either. Italy, south of France. We did whatever we wanted to do. In the early years when I started moving up the ranks in the order, as well as the increased responsibility, I got my own freedom. I'd be a fool not to enjoy it. Look, all I'm saying is the holidays. In those early years, I had to ignore Vera Murphy's behaviour. Oh, yes, I did take a glass or two of wine. She encouraged me. And the ones back home, Shavira wasn't going to tell them. In later years, she wasn't too bad. The friendship with Vera Murphy, it came at a price. I'd remind her of that. And let me tell you, she would have never got to principal officer if it wasn't for me keeping her on the straight and narrow, telling her to keep away from the drink. Well, you know a lot about secrets, don't you? You carried enough in your life. Whatever I've done, or whatever they say I've done, it was a response to what women like you did. Women like me? Mel, the world has moved on. What I did was nothing. Nothing compared to what you did. <laughs> what are you saying, Vera? The woman who didn't know which man made her pregnant? The one who had so many she didn't know what his name was? Then the one that had ideas of going to England? And you're telling me you did nothing wrong? I didn't go to England, did I? You talked me out of that. Why? So that you could lord it over me all those years? Or so that you could punish my child for what I did? For having the life you never had? No man ever wanted you, Mel. You've lost the run of yourself. Let me remind you that you didn't want that child. Even before you knew it was the way it was. Oh. Oh, and I hate to hurt you like this, but it was all over Sligo before you were 21. You were loose and easy. <sighs> Men may not have wanted me because I wasn't like you, Vera. I wouldn't give them anything. But you gave them everything with a smile. Like I said, the world has moved on. Sex isn't such a big sin anymore. And that's something you'll never understand or know. I'm not interested in your sanctimonious, self-righteous nonsense. Nobody is. All I want to know is what did you do to my daughter? Oh. What did you do to my Caroline? Your daughter. Is that how it is? After 30 years, you're calling her your daughter. I remember in that hospital you didn't even want to look at her. You didn't even come to the christening. I asked you what name you wanted. I was hoping you'd call it after your mother. But no, you had no interest in that child, let alone a name. So don't start with this my daughter nonsense. You didn't rear her, feed her, teach her how to wipe her own nose. You've no idea. You've absolutely no idea how much you're implicated. Stop hiding behind your order and some system that even you don't believe in. Tell me what you did to her. Tell me now, Mel. Just between me and you. Don't wait for some big hearing. Just tell me what you did to my little girl. Like I said, nobody wanted those children. We did what we had to do. Some of them were more difficult than others, and your little brat was in that category. We did the best we could. 
We taught them right from wrong. Give them a chance. And now, because the world has changed, we're guilty of something that wasn't expected or asked of us. Jesus, Nell, it's me. You have to tell me. For years it crossed my mind how she was, but I couldn't ask. Why wouldn't you let me have a photograph? Do you remember all the times I plagued you? One lousy photograph. I just wanted some part of her, but you said no. No, no, no. What was that about? No system told you to do that. That was just you. You gave her to me. She was mine, and then you were asking for her back. I wasn't going to give her to you. She was my child. Oh, you gave her to me, and that's how I understood it. I said it then, and I'm saying it now. Wanting photographs, you wanted visits, all that maudlin. It wasn't going to help the child. You weren't going to take her. Your life was already made. You had no room for a daughter, let alone a daughter like her. The thing about it is, Vera, I did what was best for Caroline. I kept her away from you so as not to be confused. Is that such a bad thing? Did I do that wrong? And, and yes, I did it for her, not, not for you, Vera Murphy. Please, Mel, a lifetime of friendship... Please tell me something more than this. Tell me you were angry, tell me you were envious, tell me you were lonely, but don't tell me that that was about love. And don't you dare say that my daughter Caroline was yours. Don't you dare. We did our best. I did my best. And if you want to use the word love, well, that's what it was. Not the soft, stupid kind that you went looking for in a man. The kind of love we gave those children made them strong for life, made them independent, made them know their place in the world. Vera, our job was real. There was no fluffy psychology. No, we didn't go around telling them how beautiful or great they were. We taught them how to survive. There were so many of them. They got unruly. And just like your father used to say, a little bit of discipline can bring you very far in life. Jesus, you've lost it. Is that the way you rationalise it? You're not going to tell me anything, are you? There's no point. You were always like that, always right, always the smart one. Oh, the Order knew what they were getting when they accepted you. Last weekend, the phone never stopped. Nieces I never knew I had. Nephews, pups, saying they were freelance. They wanted something off the record. <laughs> family. When they get to my age, they'll realise that family connection, it means nothing. The phone calls. Oh, I'll meet you for lunch. You and my mother were neighbours. Would you do an on-camera piece for the six o'clock news? Clear your name. But that's what got on my nerves. These people forget. Nobody else wanted these type of children. They weren't exactly dotes. Particularly Vera's one. Vera didn't want her own. Oh, she was busy making history in the civil service while we were rearing her little yoke of a daughter. Vera Murphy told me the father, whoever he was, made her do it. But I know her. She was always gamey, couldn't wait to get out of Sligo after she let all the young fellas in the area have a go on her. Oh, she'd tell you a different story. Oh, but her poor mother. We all knew Vera Murphy had to be watched. 
A very different woman now to what she was then. Then she followed me to Dublin. Her father had a word in the school and she got extra classes in order for her to do the civil service exams. But the rest of us didn't have fathers that could have words with the nuns. She brags about being one of the first women to join the civil service. All the bragging. But she was always loose, in every way, going into men's roles as well as their beds. Oh, that, that was another thing about Vera. Right up until the day her mother and father were buried, she bad-mouthed them. They did all they could for her. We met a couple of times in Dublin when she followed me up first. She was ashamed of me. Because I was a novice. What are they going to do to me? What's going to happen? What are they saying? Each day, each night, I'm losing bits of myself. Bits of my memory. Bits of dignity. You know me, Vera. Over the years, I never asked much of you. Now, I'm asking, please. You really are afraid, aren't you? They were afraid, too. But you went after them, you picked on them, you bullied them. And now you're asking me to help you. Mel, I can't. It's over. It's over for us, and it's over for you. The idea was we'd mess with disabled girls. Not in a bad way. Mess is the wrong word. I would have never even looked at girls like Caroline. Part of the package of mainstream education, you tend to look down on other disabled people. Apart from the lads I played sport with. Sport was different. That was pride. Caroline, at that party, there was a crowd of them, young ones. The music had stopped playing. They were all asking her to sing, and she did. Dance me to the end of love. It was a Leonard Cohen song. I never heard it before. Then she sang another one. Sean started making his moves on her. She wasn't having any of it. I remember he wanted to get off with her. Caroline seemed to hold her body back and get really afraid. Sean kept trying. I said, man, she's not into it. Leave her alone. Looking at Caroline, I asked, are you all right? How are you getting home? They were waiting for her. Instinctively, I went over to the car with her. In silence, she just got into the front seat. Her friends were laughing at Sean. He was passed out in my doorway. I waved at Caroline. The other girls waved at me. She just put her head down as the car sped away. Hotel probably would have been better. I just didn't know what. Here is fine. I didn't want to meet you. Brian made me do it. I'm sorry. The letters, they weren't enough. You never wrote when I was small. I would have loved a Christmas or a birthday card. I did send them. I sent them to Mel. She never gave them to me. I used to hate my birthday. It it reminded me I'd no one. The 15th of August, 1980. 30 years of not knowing you and now you show up. I can't hold it any longer. I'm, I'm boiling mad with you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for upsetting you. This is not how I wanted it. How did you want it? What do you want... What can I give you? Not sure what I want. 
I was hoping maybe we could start out being friends, get to know one another. I know I can't fill the gap, but I want to have some sort of relationship. See, this is the problem. All my life, people like you talking down to me. I'm not talking down to you. Please, I wouldn't do that. What did you expect? All this... Your letters, you interrupted my life, and now I feel you're trying to take over again. You've the same way as Mel has. Oh, Jesus, please don't say that. I'm not like Mel. I'm nowhere near like Mel. You have to trust me. You're asking someone that you shoved into an institution to trust you. And then you're asking me to trust that you're not like Mel. Trust a woman that didn't want me. Can you not see what you're doing? Oh, tr- trust is the wrong word, but I, I don't know what other word to use. I'm trying to explain. I'm not like Mel. Nobody can be like Mel. She's one of a kind. I need to explain something. Something that's bigger than the both of us. It's about the report. Remember, I mentioned it in my letters. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. And don't try and make me talk or catch me out with your fancy words. If that's what you're expecting, it won't happen. If you don't tell me, you'll have to tell someone else. There'll be a team of people put together. Judges, a doctor, a lawyer, but you'll have your own lawyer. I just wanted to tell you before you heard it from anyone official. Don't be frightened. People will help you. Stop. Just stop. What sort of an idiot am I? There was I thinking you were meeting me because I was your daughter. God, how stupid am I? Is that stupid report that was in your letters? I am meeting you because you're my daughter. The thought of someone hurting you or, or you having to go through this stuff alone. I just wanted to help. You're not helping and I'm not alone. The truth of the matter is this is about you. Guilt. You're like the rest of them. You knew what was going on and you did absolutely nothing. Not only did you know what was going on, but Mel was your best friend and you never did anything. How could I? I did try. There you go again. Patronising me, thinking I don't understand how difficult it was for you. Just for a second, remind yourself you only read the report. I lived through that. Me and hundreds like me written on those pages and now we're supposed to feel bad because it's difficult for you to read. Vera, the truth is I'm backward and stupid. That's what they told me. That's what they wrote about me and maybe that's how I am. But I don't need you coming back making things worse. Brian read your letters. I asked him to... I wasn't really sure what you were trying to ask me. That's what they've done to me. Made me feel foolish, no confidence. Like, I can't make a decision about anything since you started writing to me. And that can only be a bad thing. I was all right before those letters. Now me and Brian are going to break up because of you. He wants to give you a chance, but he's like that, giving everybody chances. Sometimes he's an idiot of a man. We never quite got over the dinner party episode. I had my suspicions, her and Sean. Cheating wouldn't be a word that I'd use for Caroline, but I knew we were drifting. In the early years, my family, they never actually said it, But because of our history, they kept saying, you've an awful lot of baggage, you're taking on too much. Going out together, moving in together, and eventually asking her to marry me, I kind of always knew she thought I was an idiot. It became really obvious when all this stuff started to spill out. She was hiding letters, acting very strange. 
Sean seemed to be over all the time, and yet I knew she had no interest in him. Nonetheless, he was closer to her, closer to my wife, and that drove me insane. I handled it all wrong, confronted her. What an idiot I am. Not for a second did I suspect her birth mother would want to get in touch. All the secrets, all the running around, bursting into tears, not wanting to go anywhere, not wanting me, not wanting us, not wanting sex. Looking back, that was probably the biggest clue of all. Tell me about your life when you were young. About how you got pregnant with me. About Mel. None of th that was in your letters. It was the 70s. I'd left school and was delighted to get a job in the civil service. All the other girls in my town, well, most of them were heading to England to do nursing training. Except for Mel, who had joined a religious order also in Dublin. I got a flat and started work. I made friends and life seemed good. I'd go home every two weeks and bring Mam some money. Imagine I never had a granny. Families, when you don't have one, you, you can never imagine what it's like to be part of one. Brian's family, everything is cosy and, and rosy. The perfect family. Well, I didn't have much of a family. That was another reason why I was dying to get away from home. I hated my father. He was a man of his time. <laughs> Treated my mother, my poor mother, like a dog. And I was damn sure no man would ever do that to me. Go on. You got away from the family and you came to Dublin. What happened then? <sighs> the 70s. They were great days in Dublin if you had a job. I made friends with the work crowd. We used to go to dances. <laughs> the Dublin girls used to laugh at us country ones. We'd be still trying to go to ballroom dances while they were heading for discos and live music. Heavy rock stuff. My crowd, sure. <laughs> we were all still in love with Joe Dolan. Were you a good dancer? Were you into clothes? Did you never go back to Sligo? Ah, oh, There was nothing much for me in Sligo. When people asked me where I was from, I never knew what to say. As I get older, I, I just say I'm from Dublin. Brian says we might have a weekend away in Sligo one of these days. Go on. Tell me more about that time in your life. The job was always what mattered to me. Yes, ambition. That too. I bought my own car. A new Mini. <laughs> My father hated it, said it was a death trap. <laughs> I had my eye on nobody, and nobody had their eye on me. But I had plenty of company. And the girls I shared the flat with. Did he want to marry you? Did you know him? Was he from Sligo or, or Dublin? Do you still know him now? No, I didn't know him. I'm not even sure where he was from. He was at a party. I knew I didn't have to do very much to get his attention. He did it all. I remembered the date. He was good looking. I can see bits of him in you. Your eyes. His eyes were blue as well. I went along with it. Ah, The long and the short of it was, he said, are you right? I said yes, not knowing what else to say. This is back in his flat. He was on top of me, doing what men do, while I was trying to figure out the lyrics of the Joan Baez song in the next room. Did he even know that you were pregnant? Uh, you have to understand, it was a different Ireland. A different world. He was no use to me. I knew that. Did you think of... I even got a ticket for the boat. It was Mel. Sister Mel that stopped me. How did you know Mel? We'd been to school together. All the way up. She knew all my secrets, though I never knew any of hers. 
That time in Dublin, I had nobody, so I went to Mel. She helped me, and she never let me forget it. Hiding the bump for the last few months was really difficult. I thought about telling Mam, but sure, I knew she'd tell Dad and he'd take it out on her. Mel organised me, and when the final part came, she was there. Even in school, she looked down on me, so when I asked for help from her, it was like she expected it and was delighted to lord it over me. I remember at the time thinking it was easier to give the child to her than to a stranger or a social worker. She wanted a child more than me. She would have been a very bad mother, a dangerous mother. She was in a crisp white habit. I'm sure the nurses thought Mel was some battle-axe nun helping an unmarried mother. Well, not so much helping, but bossing. In school, she bossed everyone. Even the other nuns, the young ones. Some of them were kind, but Mel used to tell them not to be soft. Then why did you get in touch? What came over you? I'm 30. You're not dying of anything, are you? You're you're not sick or something. (laughs) No, I'm not sick. Well, not in that way. I I wanted to ask you... I wanted to tell you things. Explain things if I could. I've almost lived half my life without you. Without your help... Why would I need it now? An affair was the first thing that came into my mind. Well, it was obvious to me anyway. When she spilled it out, the mopping up couldn't be done. Everything I said was wrong. Telling her to go for therapy, telling her to talk to Mel... Eventually, telling her to go and see her mother, that was it. That's how our marriage ended. She said, you don't understand, you've no idea what it's like. And the worst of all, she said, you're just like everyone else. You want to fix me. Tell me it never happened. See a therapist so I can talk the truth out of myself so that I won't believe it. After that, she had no respect for me. I tried everything, even Sean. I met him for a couple of pints, and he just froze when I asked what happened in that school they were in. What did they do to my wife? The funny thing is, she's meeting her birth mother this morning. Guess who's waiting outside for her? Guess. Her consoler and minder, Sean. They've history, history that I don't know or understand. Over the years, there were always jokes about how I was so perfect, the perfect family, perfect childhood. Caroline used to say, you didn't get the perfect wife. Her childhood was something we talked about, but really, she gave very little away. Opening up to me was difficult for her, and I did try and listen Obviously, I hadn't been listening at all. The beatings. Caroline mentioned names of some of the lads. They were on my basketball team and poor Sean. I had no idea what they'd been through. She talked about everything as if it was about somebody else. Anybody else but her. Tell me about me, What did you know about me? Why did you never send me anything? Did you know what I looked like? How can you just forget about your own child? Maybe I was too weak and Mel had too much power. She said you were okay without me, and I believed her. You weren't really that desperate, or or were you? Desperate? Yes, I was. Desperate enough to give my own child up. Oh, it's not easy to understand, but she had power over me. She was a nun from my hometown. Even if you didn't have an abortion, you could have went to England 
we could have had some sort of life. It's not that simple. Mel did hurt me in many, many ways over the years. How? What did she do? Mel said I should stop trying to get into your life. It was too confusing for you. And like a fool, I believed her. Still, she never said stop sending money. Not even one photograph. I asked her so many times. After all these years, you think it's because of the report. That's just made me want to meet you more. But for the last 15 years, I tried. Trying isn't enough. Thinking about you, wondering about you, asking Mel. Your age, my age, I th thought it wouldn't happen. Somewhere in my mind, I was half afraid you'd love Mel. Selfish, I know. The stuff in the report... I knew there was going to be some sort of legal redress board. Your institution was on every page. I couldn't sleep at night. Caroline, it's not nearly what I could have done or what I should have done. But I wanted to meet you. I confronted Mel and that gave me the strength to ask for a meeting. Finally, you agreed. Were you at the christening? No. After five days, I handed you over to Mel. She took care of all that. The christening, everything. And the years in between. What happened? When did you know I am the way I am with cerebral palsy? When you were five, Mel rang me in work. She told me on the phone. She refused to meet me. You had been diagnosed with a condition. She used the word spastic. To tell you the truth, I think she was happy that I didn't have a perfect child. That I got that wrong too. It was her that had something wrong with her. She said there was no point in making contact with you. I was told they were having trouble trying to find a family that would adopt. I didn't need much. You could have managed... We could have managed. Mel assured me you'd be fine. You'd be put into a special school run by her order and she'd watch out for you. So that's it? Mel bullied you and she bullied the rest of us? And you're coming back asking how much she affected me? There must be something else. You ignored me for 30 years. I knew you'd be angry with me. I rang the agency every two weeks. I was often tempted to get Mel involved, but realised women like her have no real influence anymore. They kept repeating, Vera, we've made contact, but the young woman hasn't replied, and that's her right. Oh, I used to hate that. The young woman. You were my daughter. Not some random young one. I'm not your anything. And no, I'm not your daughter. <sighs> I answered everything you asked me in the best way I could. These were the reasons I did what I did. I'm so very, very sorry. You're sorry? Guess what? I'm sorry too. Have you any idea? The letters were fine, but this shit of wanting to see me... I don't understand. The letters... I wasn't sure. I couldn't ask. How do you ask? And you never mentioned anything. You want the list. The list of what happened. That's what you really want, isn't it? Well, I wasn't keeping a diary. Anyway, what would come first? A sense of abandonment from my mother? Then I'd work my way down. I'd have to ask myself... Who hurt me the most? My mother or the nuns, Sister Mel or you? If the abuse report wasn't coming out, would I even cross your mind? What if there's no list? Would that mean you're off the hook? Your conscience could rest. Now I know why you're here. It was all about you. You, your job. 
in my letters I made up all of it. The kindness of nuns, the lovely sister Mel, the good job I had, the truth was... I'm sorry. The... I'm sorry. My manners. Mel would kill me now if she saw the way I was acting. Even at my age, she still has power over me. She's not even in my life. I've never told anyone this. I, I've held it inside of me, but... Imagine, Brian. He made me invite her to our wedding. Between you and me, it might be the only secret we ever have. But I wanted to kill him for suggesting that. I went along with it. The wedding pictures, that's why he wanted Mel there. When, when I hear you saying sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Which bit are you sorry for? Dumping me with the nuns, not getting in touch. I was so... I was so lonely. That's what it did to me. It made me lonely and needy. Just like you. You're not like me. To survive what you've lived through takes courage and strength. That's what strangers say. They're only referring to my CP. The truth is it's the mundane details of living that are unmanageable. You never think it sleeping that's when I feel most afraid eating I either eat too much eat too little or don't eat at all then my biggest worry my CP as I age I'll have to go back into some sort of institution will it happen all over again the nuns without their uniforms, other people, people like you, Vera. You're no different to Mel. You didn't want a disabled daughter. Whatever way you dress it up, you didn't really care about the stigma and shame of being a single parent. Your CP had nothing to do with it. Maybe my choices were wrong, but I made them with good intentions. Was your intention to forget about me? Pay a nun off and you just carried on with your life? Was that how it was? Your lovely friend Mel? Well, let's just say you don't make it to matron of a special school on the virtues of kindness. <laughs> Did you know... That kids who were orphans were treated worse. Orphans, travellers, Protestants and poor children. I won't even tell you what they thought of kids who were made outside of marriage. The sexual thing, she told me, they did what they wanted to the children. She explained the older children, teenagers, they in turn would do it to each other. In bathrooms, girls with all sorts of disabilities were pushed up against the wall. Caroline said there was always more than one lad involved. It was the next question, the most obvious, but I just couldn't bring myself to ask her. The next day was Sunday. We hadn't slept much. I read the letters out loud to her like she'd asked. I took Monday and Tuesday off work just to be with her. We drove out the country past the old institution. It never occurred to me until then that we should have done it earlier. But really I had no idea. Then everything made sense. The letters... Her mother wanted to meet her. What do you say? What do you tell someone you love? How do you ask them which part of the story is theirs? Which part of the abuse happened to you? All of it? 
some of it or none of it. Then she told me, Mel, Sister Mel, had rubbed excrement on her face because Caroline had caught diarrhoea the night before her communion. She was seven. That day when Sister Melda said there was no need for me to have my hair put in wrinkles like the other girls, it would take too much time. I was lucky to have a veil. That was the day in my life that I stopped believing I had a mother. I sent money. I sent Mel a dress for you and shoes. Mel put it on somebody else. She said I would dirty it. It built it up in my head that maybe you'd come. I even told the other girls, my mammy's coming. But she didn't. For weeks afterwards, the girls were laughing at me. They'd be singing, where's your mama gone? Even Mel. I still remember she said, she's too busy for your communion. Your mother has no decency or responsibility. There's nothing that you've said that I haven't asked myself. It was now or never, I can't lie. I just didn't want a baby. And then later on, when I heard... When you heard what? When you heard what, Vera? What did Mel tell you? Mel said you were as bright as a button. All the talk in the world and all the explanations won't make sense of where we are now. I could have kept on writing, but there were things I needed to know. Things that Mel couldn't be asked... She was so cruel to some of the girls. Not just me, some of the other ones. She beat the shit out of us for no reason. Locked us in bathrooms overnight. Constantly telling us that we're useless. Good for nothing. That nobody had ever wanted us and nobody ever would. Every day. All the time. She took everything we had inside us and turned us into nothing. Now you're about to tell me that she destroyed you too. That's not good enough. I don't care what Mel did to you. When you were 11 or 12, she told me you were beautiful. She said you were independent. Not that great at school, but very good at everything else. The only reason I was no good in school was they kept me back. Put me in a classroom with three-year-olds, drawn pictures. Then, as I got older, knitting and sewing. Real good skills for someone like me. But you went back. You did your leaving and you got your degree. No, thanks, a special school they just wrote me off like you did wiped me out of the picture for years and years I sit in front of a mirror and try to imagine who I looked like anybody that came into the institution to visit other kids I used to stare at them then when I got older you know, out in the real world, as they say, I used to look at people, random, strangers, women in shops. I used to look at them and try and see if there was any of me in them. It wasn't Christmas Day or birthdays or even Mother's Day. Do you want to know when it was? Mammy. That's what I would have called you. I I would have said, Mammy, I got my period. That was the only day I ever wished that I was like everyone else. But I wasn't, was I? Not even on my wedding day did I miss you. 
Isn't it odd for a daughter to say that? <laughs> we have the same hands, the same size. I don't paint my nails. Do you paint yours? No, 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 I don't paint my nails. It was never... It, it was never because... I don't care. Lots of people, even nowadays, don't want to have disabled children. You're not that special, so don't go thinking you are. Did anything else happen to you? You've no right to ask me that. Brian said it must have been hard for women like you. He soft. Maybe you thought I was stupid. Like I said, you read the report. I lived it. You're just as guilty as the rest of them. Vera, this is about you. You're in that report more than I am. If you had left me alone instead of coming back, your guilt shouldn't intrude on my life. I lived in the shithole of a Catholic institution. You left me 30 years ago and now I'm leaving you. I did try. All those years, I never forgot I had a daughter. Oh, you're right, maybe I didn't try hard enough. I was hoping something half normal would come out of all this. Is that so wrong? Wanting to make it up? Wishing things were different between us. What are you talking about? This isn't about the report. It's about me and you. That was She's Not Mine by Rosalind McDonough, with Liz Fitzgibbon as Caroline. Bernadette McKenna played the birth mother Vera, Deirdre Monaghan, Sister Mel, and Andrew Bennett was Brian. Sound supervision was by Mark McGrath. The dramaturg was Jesper Bergman. She's Not Mine was produced by Aidan Matthews. Old Men Are Jealous by Jennifer Johnston. She is widely regarded as one of Ireland's foremost contemporary novelists. Jennifer Johnston occupies a curious place in Irish literature. Although her talent is widely recognized and she has won many awards, her works have so far rarely appeared in critical studies of contemporary Irish literature. Born in Dublin in 1930 to the playwright Dennis Johnston and the actor and producer Shalai Richards, Johnston was educated at Trinity College Dublin and lived for many years in County Derry before returning to Dublin where she now lives. Her first novel was published in 1972 when she was 42, and since then she has published 18 novels. Old Men Are Jealous by Jennifer Johnston In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. I pray for them all. Not on my knees anymore, I'm too old for that. I pace the room. I will pace the room as long as my legs bear me up. I will pray for them as long as I have breath. I've been here down all the years. Since the first men came, and that, I can tell you, was not today nor yesterday. I have watched. I have listened to stories of happiness, of great sorrow. Tragedies and comedies have slithered in and out of my head. Turn the wheel and the story spin. What, as they say, goes around, comes around. I feel as if I will always be here, pacing and praying. 
Hear that? I live close to the airport. I don't mind that. I like to think of all those people travelling around the world, having adventures. I like the sounds of the planes landing and taking off. And when I heard the sound earlier in the day, I was so happy. My thoughts danced in my head. That will be them now. That will be the plane at last. The young ones coming home. Dee, my lovely girl. Oh, my heart will lighten to see her. Seven years it's been. Oh, she will be well grown. She was hardly more than a child when they left. Beautiful child. Two children they were. Running as if life were a game. Away from this island. Out of the king's reach. I prayed to the Blessed Virgin Mary that he would have a change of heart. Sometimes she listens and sometimes she pays no heed. But his heart has thawed. Yes, the hatred, that jealousy has run out from his veins. In spite of the things they say about him, the papers, the lawmen, he is a kind and warm man, a loving man, a generous man. I've listened to him talk about her these last couple of weeks. His voice is soft. His words are soft. No evil. Not a word of evil. I put my hand on his shoulder one time and said, There, man. There, good man. It would be so good to see her and to forgive them. Forgiveness makes you light again. He smiled. I like to see him smile. He hasn't smiled much in the seven years she was away. And they were bad brats, the pair of them, running like that. Not telling a soul that might have advised them. I could have advised them well. Stay, I would have said to her. Don't raise his anger. Let the lad scoot off back to wherever it is he comes from, but let you stay and marry the king. Just like you said you would do. You promised. Remember that, you brat. But would she have listened? I don't suppose she would. Love... I ask you. Not all it's cracked up to be. Well, that's my view. They should have known he wasn't a man to tangle with. They'd been told often enough. And she would have seen it during the years he looked after her when her parents had been killed by the Cassidys. Bad bunch they were. He took her under his wing then. A pretty child, full of jokes and laughter. He saw to the slaughtering of the Cassidys. Liquidation, I should say. Total liquidation. All the guards could do was look on in amazement and a certain degree of admiration. I'd imagine that anyway. Wasn't he doing their job for them? Cleaning up the city? It's no wonder we all called him the king. There was no proof that he did it. He had a thousand alibis. No wonder at all. And if that young fella hadn't manifested himself, she would have been the Queen. <laughs> her Royal Majesty. I would have minded her. Seen to it that all was well. Made sure she had everything she wanted. Made sure her way was smooth. Instead, Janie Mack, off the silly girl runs with the lead singer from a boy band. Not even one of the well-known bands, not at all. There were a crowd from the West who warmed up the audiences before the stars got to work. Mind you, they've made it to the top now. Faces in the papers when they come to town, their songs blaring out at you every time you turn on the wireless. She met him at one of those weekend concerts they have all over the place in the summer. Nicky. A nice enough lad. Nicky, no sense. Would you have a bit of sense, I said to them, and they laughed at me. If he finds out what ye are up to, he'll have your guts for garters. And the pair of them laughed at me again. They were so happy. It made you happy just to look at them. For weeks it went on. The pair of them running around the town, dancing, picnics beyond in the Wicklow Mountains... Concerts, swimming in the middle of the night out of the 40 foot. She blossomed. Just to look at her in those days would take the sight from your eyes. 
Where was the king, I hear you ask, when all this was going on? Well, you might ask, in Portugal. That's where he was. Every summer he went there for a month or two. He had a house there for the golf. He thought the golf gave him some sort of class. So he would spend May and June there each year. He had a boat and all the accoutrements of the very rich and other very rich people used to go and stay with them. He asked me once would I go out there and housekeep for him. I would not, says I. Not for all the tea in China. I'm quite happy here, my two feet under my own table. What would I want to go farting for? Anyway, somehow word must have got to him out there and he decided to come home for a couple of days. Surprise us all. Have a look-see. He certainly surprised me. I was stitching, mending sheets, and annoyed I was. She had the player on so loud in her room I couldn't hear myself pink. She knows I hate that song, and she was pestering me with it. He was squealing, and I stuck the needle in my finger, and all of a sudden the hall door opened. I never heard it. There was a little blob of blood on my finger and another on the sheet. Ah, damn the girl, damn the music, damn the needle. No, oh, Jesus. Mother of God, King. Oh, you put the heart across me. What are you doing here? Has something happened? What's that god-awful noise? Here, take me handkerchief, wrap it around your finger. Must we have that noise? Oh, it's that bad girl. She's plaguing me with it. For the last half hour, it's been on like that, bawling. There's no point in me speaking to her about it. She'll just leave it on all night. I'll soon see about that. Dee, Dee, turn off that bloody machine, will you? I just sat there and wrapped his handkerchief around my finger. I could hear him yelling. I wondered why he was here. Why wasn't he out there in Portugal playing golf with his rich friends? I tied a knot. I was shaking. The sound of his shouting made me shake. But also I was wondering, would Nick pop in? He did that at all hours of the night or day. I felt in my trembling bones that that would not be good. The music stopped. Silence was enormous. Then I heard him coming back along the passage, striding through the silence. You mustn't be too hard on her now. The poor child has been missing me. I've been away from her for too long. That music fills the loneliness inside her. I didn't say a word. The Lord God himself must have gagged me with his hand, and then she came running in. She threw her arms around my neck and kissed me. Her hot fingers pushed a piece of paper into the neck of my dress. I need some wine. I kept mum. I just watched her carry on. Watched her apparent joy in his return, but I recognised the desperation underneath every gesture, every tone of her voice. I got such a fright when he walked in. I thought... I thought in... Yeah, Portugal... And yet, dear King, you've come back to me. What did I think? I thought... I thought... Oh, how good to see you back here again. There's nothing to drink. No. Will you run around to the off-license and get a bottle of wine? There's a dear pet. Would you do that? Don't go sending new off on a wild goose chase. Just to see you so beautiful is wine enough for me. Come here, child, and sit beside me. And leave now to a stitching. No, I, I must have wine. Tomorrow we'll drink wine in Portugal, you and me. No, I couldn't. I can't. No arguments. I've left you alone for too long. No. Uh, no, I couldn't go. Not tomorrow. Clothes. I have no clothes. I have things to see to. Don't worry about clothes. You can buy anything you want there. Anything. Silks, velvet, jewellery, flowers... He'd be like a queen, my queen. He put out his two hands and pulled her against him. It was as if I was glued to the floor. I couldn't move an inch. Her poor little face was drained of blood. Go now, go, she whispered towards me. Go and get the... He put his hand on our breast and I turned and ran. 
I wasn't much of a runner, but by Jesus, I ran that evening, so I did. I ran to every bar he frequented, puffing and panting. Number four he was in, seated there with his group, all of them full of joking and full of laughter. When he saw my face, he got up and came over to me. He took me by the arm. What is it, Neil? What's the matter? Is she all right? Sit down, dear woman, and catch your breath. I have no time to be sitting down. I must get back to her. He has come. He? The king. Just quite unexpectedly, he threw open the door and walked in. I was flummoxed. Here, she gave me a note for you. Flummoxed. He's come back. What does she say? Read it, man. What does she... Help me. Is that all? That's all. I must go to her now. No. I must. She needs me. He'll kill her. Of course he won't kill her. He wants her. He'll never kill her, but there's no saying what he might do to you if you were to go rushing in there full of bravado and stupidity. Oh, my blood runs cold to think of what might happen. I can't just sit here and do nothing. I haven't even got a gun. Well, thanks be to God for that anyway. Have a bit of sense, boy. I'll have to be running back or he'll begin to wonder what's happened to me. Get your brains to work. I'll tell you you're on the job. I'd pacify her. Just take care, boy. Take care. I didn't run. I hadn't the energy left in me to run, but I walked fast. And it wasn't until I reached the garden gate that I realised that I had no wine in my hand for her. No alibi, so to speak. I opened the door with caution. No voices. Not a sound except the soft shuffle of her feet on the floor. Backwards and forwards she went across the sitting room floor, all in the dark. Dee, I called her, my voice no more than a whisper. Dee! No, you're back. Oh, no, I'm so frightened. What are we going to do? Did you see him? What is he going to do? Oh, no! Calm yourself, little darling, calm yourself. Where's the king? He's gone. He'll be back soon, though, and then we're going to Portugal. Tonight, now. We're going tonight. He's coming back for me, and we're flying out in his plane. We're going to... (laughs) Oh, no. What will I do? Shush, shush, baby, shush. We're going to be married. How can I shush? How can you tell me to shush? Where is Nick? Did you give him my note? Married. Do you hear me now? Married. I'd rather die. Oh, now don't be talking such nonsense. Here, wipe your face. You look a right mess. Nick will be here at any moment. He is hard on my heels. You said he wouldn't be too long. He's been gone about 20 minutes. He had to organise a crew. Well, go and get your bag and your passport and we'll see what happens. With a bit of luck, Nick will be here first. I've got some money in the drawer by my bed. You can have that if the worst comes to worst. Well, go on, scoot. Don't just stand there like an idiot. One of these fellas is going to arrive first and you have to make up your mind. Portugal or God knows where. Which is it to be? I'm afraid. And you've a right to be afraid. You've made a right bloody mess of things. But standing around and moaning about being afraid will get you nowhere. Scoot, I say, or he'll be in on us and wash your face and, and you need your coat. There's a little chill in the air. She ran. She was suddenly galvanised. She kissed the side of my face and flew like a wild bird out of the room. And I sat my old bones into the armchair and wondered what was going to happen to her, to them, to me. Through all the years I'd been around, I had never been more anxious about my own safety than at that moment. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for me. I wished I believed that such words could save me. Maybe, of course, they did. I'm still here. It was only a few minutes before she was back again. But it had seemed like hours to me. I didn't touch your money. I didn't take any money. I I don't want to take anything at all. I just want to go. Get out of here. He said he was behind you. What can have happened to him? 
I'll know if anything's happened. Don't work yourself up into another <laughs> state. He'll be along. There. Is that his car coming? Hold my hand and keep watching out of the window. He'll come out of the darkness. He'll come and fetch you away. Do you remember that game you used to play with pals out in the street? Here comes someone to fetch you away, fetch you away, fetch you away. <laughs> he used to sing that and stand in a big circle. Here he is now. That car is slowing down. It's flashing its lights. Quick now, girl, dear. Off you go. It stopped. A kiss for new. Here comes Nicky to fetch you away. Oh, no, I'll miss you so much. Will you be all right? Come with us. Why don't you, please? Be off. Be happy, child. I may never see you in reality again, but I'll see you in my dreams. Run! Ah, now, where is she? We take off in about an hour. Dee, come, darling. Everything is settled. Next time you see us, now we'll be man and wife. How about that? Dee, for fuck's sake, get a move on! No need to shout. She can't hear you. She's gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Gone where? Stop snivelling, old woman. Tell me where she's gone. I don't know. Honest to God, I don't know. She just ran out and got into his car and away they went. Away, out, slammed the door behind her. She never said a word. Here one minute and gone the next. Who is he? I don't know. I swear to God I haven't an idea. She's been going in and out, round and about. You know the way the young are. Never tell you a thing. You were supposed to be mind enough for me. Not letting her go gallivanting off with heaven knows who. I trusted you to mind her for me. No! What did you want me to do? Lock her up? She had her friends. You never told me she wasn't to see her friends. She would have hated me if I'd done that. And she would have hated you too. She would have known it was at your command. Sure hasn't she known those girls since she was little? School, playground. Aren't they growing up together? Lovely young ones they are too. Youth, Sir King, must have his fling. You were not supposed to be super boys not having a fling. You're supposed to be looking after her. I thought I made that clear. Clear! Are you listening to me? Don't I always listen to you? Morning, noon and night I listen to you. I reared that girl. I was mother and father to her. And a better girl you won't find in the four provinces of Ireland. If you look till doomsday... Let her have her little bit of fun before you shut her up in that mansion you built for her out near Kildare. Where will the fun be there? She will have everything she wants. She will only have to speak or wish. And her youth will be gone. Her beautiful, adventurous youth. And it'll never come again. How dare you? How dare you? Don't you raise your fist towards and me. And don't you raise your voice at me, old woman. You should know well what happens to people who do that. Oh, indeed, and I do. And I'll not have anything evil happen to Dee. Do you hear me? Clear down me way. I'm not harm you can be sure of that. But that man, that young fella, me lad, I'll see the way he's torn limb from limb. Get out of me way! One day, it must have been near on a year since that night, the postman knocked. Now, that wasn't his usual way of carrying on. He normally just dropped the letters in the box and went on his way. He handed me a postcard. A word in your ear, Mrs. New, says he. There's someone in the sorting office who's very interested in your mail. Just thought I'd give you a nod. Hurry. I was startled by his words. You've been watching too much telly, I said to him. But he was almost at the gate by the time I spoke. And then he was gone. I looked at the postcard. There was nothing on it, only my address in block capitals and a colour picture of Sydney Opera House. I knew, though, that it was from her. God bless you, my lamb, I thought, for letting me know that you were alive and well. I hid it in the drawer by my bed where I keep my few precious things and each one as it arrived went in beside it. Buenos Aires, Delhi, Tokyo, Moscow. All the world covered by those cards. Rome, 
Vienna, Paris and Berlin. The years went by until two weeks ago I was washing my front windows, the evening sun flashing in the glass. A car drew up at my gate. I thought nothing of it till I heard the gate screech and a step on the path behind me. I turned to look. It was King himself. I dropped the bucket in my excitement. King? Ah, no. Are you all right? Don't touch me. I'm soaking wet. Oh, seeing you put the heart across me. Dear man, so many years. Oh, come in, come in. Mind the bucket. We don't want you getting soaked as well as me. Sit down there now and let me have a look at you. So many years. I thought I was never going to... Calm yourself, woman. Let me speak. There. Uh, Catch your breath. Now, calm. Uh, now, look at me. I'm fine. Just fine. <laughs> no tears, my old friend. Just see how well I am. Here. I have something for you. Something that'll make you feel really good. Where did I put it? Oh, yeah. Here. A postcard? It's... Yeah? It's... Who's it from? Well, it hasn't got anything written on it, I couldn't say. What's the picture of? Buckingham Palace, London. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know. Our friends are very close to home. I think that is wonderful. Very... This is addressed to me. Wonderful. How did you get this? Ah. Uh, I have ways and means. To get a letter from a certain office is not difficult. To track down the sender is a little bit more difficult, but not impossible. No, not impossible at all. No need to look so upset now. I've become benign in my old age. All that violence is a thing of the past. I need now to be surrounded by the people I love. I want to forgive and forget. Yeah, I've been aware for some time that we can't live forever. It was when that realisation hit me that I knew I had to forgive them. I had to search them out and bring them home, honoured, much-loved guests. His face glowed with sincerity. His mouth curled in the gentlest of smiles. As I had always done, I felt in my old bones the truth was coming from his lips. Glory be to God, I thought. He took my hand in his and ran a finger over the knuckles, almost like a lover might. Glory be to God, I wanted to shout the words aloud. My D is safe. They are both safe. Dear New, you do believe me, don't you? I want what's best for them. I want him to play his songs in his own country. I want him to be happy here once more. And I want to see her, hear her voice. No more, no less. Just have her here home again. Rejoice in her beauty. Trust me. Of course I trust you. Haven't I always trusted you? In good times and in bad. <laughs> if only there were more like you, Neil. I want you to write her a note, inviting her to come here as soon as they land. Just a brief note. Don't lay it on too thick now. Tell her how pleased I am that they're coming, and my car will be waiting to meet them at the airport and bring them here. Savoy Hotel is where they're staying in London. You seem to know a lot about them. Ways and means. You'll do that, won't you? Right. That's a good woman. I'll send some of the lads around to give this place a coat of paint. Cheer it up a bit. There's nothing the matter with this place, thank you very much. Just leave it be. Freshen it up. I don't want it freshened Ah, uh, they'll be up. round in an hour. Don't argue, woman. I don't want you to worry about anything. It's not that I'm worried. That's it, then. I'll be off, so. If there's anything at all you need done, let me know. One of the lads will be around to get that letter from you. Yeah, right. That's I... a good woman, Neil. God bless you. So I waited and watched and cleaned up the little house to make it fresh for them. They must have got used to stylish living, I thought. And him, with his big successful band playing around the world as he did and staying in places like the Savoy Hotel. And then I heard the plane. 
5.25 on the dot. That plane from London is like clockwork, and my heart began to beat with the excitement that was in me. The king said he would bring champagne when he came. Personally, I think there's nothing like a good, strong cup of tea. Not like the stuff they sell you nowadays. I make the journey to Bewley's to buy my tea. But he insisted they would prefer champagne. Well, that's the high life for you. Several cars drove past and my heart was in my mouth with each one. And then one stopped. I heard the purr of the engine at the gate. Oh, glory be to all the angels. My dear little Dee is home again. Dee, my darling girl, oh, welcome home. Oh, come in, come in. Let me look at you. No, I've missed you so much. Oh, you look so well, so pretty, so happy. Stand over there till I get a good look at you. I never thought we'd see this house again. Isn't it wonderful to be home, Nick? No, it's great to see you. Uh, I wish we could stay longer. She was a child before. Can we stay on? Nick, just for a few more days. No, she's a beautiful woman. Oh, wait till King sees her. Please, Nick. Darling, no. We'll come back soon, though. I promise you that. We'll organise a mighty gig. We'll have to see how things go, and who can tell? Maybe we can find some way to operate out of Dublin. Even at her best moments, I could feel that she was thinking of home now. Her pals, the well-walked streets, Dublin, weren't you, doll? We... we... we both missed it. At odd moments, loneliness hits you like a wave. And I missed you, new. But we've seen the world. Isn't that a wonderful thing to have done? Isn't it wonderful to be able to say those words? And now we can come home again. Home. All forgiven. He wrote me such a wonderful letter now, begging us to come back, saying how, how he'd never been able to forgive himself for the, the savagery with which he treated us. Forgive. Forgive. That, that's what the letter was all about. He could only forgive himself when we forgave him. It was touching, wasn't it, darling? You were touched. I almost ran out of the Savoy and bought us tickets to Timbuktu. You're well known for having a heart of stone. But we're here, aren't we? For 24 hours. To smell the air. And where is he anyway? The king. He'll be here in his own good time. And you've no need to be worrying about anything at all. He has sworn by the blessed lady of heaven that he has become benign in his old age. And he wants nothing but the best for both of you. <laughs> oh, you can laugh away. I'm no no longer and better than anyone else. I know his truths and his lies. New knows what she's talking about, Nick. She would never let anything bad happen to us. I'm sure she wouldn't. Tell me one thing. Why would he not let us bring the rest of the band? Why just us? The two of us alone. No brothers, no pals. Answer me that. How absurd you are. Why should he want to see the others? He has no interest in them. You're still all children to him. He's getting old. And I think the heart in him was afraid you'd be a hullabalooing around the place. And he'd feel the strain. You have to think of his age. I bet he has a bus pass. <laughs> what would he want a bus pass for? <laughs> Hasn't he enough money to buy all the buses in Ireland if he wanted them? <laughs> oh, don't you be cheeky about him. He's a good man. And he loves you like a father. A bit more than a father knew, remember? That's why we ran away. Not much fatherly feeling about him then. That was seven years ago. He's changed. He sees things differently now. I have become benign in my old age. That's what he said to me a couple of weeks ago. And it's true enough. There's a man gathering at the gate. Passers-by. No, they're standing there. Look, Dee. Yeah, two, three, five, about ten. And another couple coming down the road. Are they menacing? I don't know. Of course they're not menacing. What silly children you are. Oh, here's King's car coming now. And oh, cheek, Dee, remember what I said. Hold my hand. I love you, darling. Yes. Yes.
Well, well, here we are. The strangers return. You're welcome, my dear. So welcome. Dear King, I'm so happy to see you. Let me hug you. Oh, hug, hug. <laughs> I'm so happy to be home. To be with you and New and Nick. Nick, this is King. You've never met Nick. Meet him now. Do I bow? <laughs> Nick! <laughs> or bend the knee. <laughs> what did I say to you about cheek? Shake the hand, perhaps. May I shake your hand, sir? Oh, you're as handsome as they told me. <laughs> and young. And talented. Hey, are you as talented as they told me? Is he, Dick? He is. Just wait till you hear him sing. His, his voice is rich and wild. Rich and wild. Well, well. you sing for us this evening, won't you, Nick? If he wants me to. You mustn't bully any of us, darling. I will listen with pleasure to the sound of him singing later. That'll be for later. Now, let's have a little drop of champagne to celebrate your return. Then we can go to my house. Yeah, and we listen to this young man singing. We we'll eat and drink and dance and have a high old time. And you can tell me what you've done for the past seven years and how much you've missed us all. So much. So much. But I've been terribly happy too. I have to tell you the truth about that. The garden is full of men. Well, do they worry you? They make me curious. Curiosity killed a cat. Pull over the curtains there so they can't see us. They're just some of my men filled with curiosity <laughs> about you two the pop star and the beauty I said I didn't think you'd mind of coming over and having a peep of course you don't mind where's the champagne king they can watch us drinking that <laughs> they can press their noses against the window and see us celebrating perhaps even enough for them too time enough for that pull over the curtains there young man and pop out of the car <laughs> I've stupidly left the bottle in the back seat <laughs> I'll go and get it no no, the loud go, won't you? Of course. I'll come with you. No. We'll only be a minute or two. I'll come with you. No. I don't want you out of my sight. One minute. Not even for one minute. Not even for the blink of an eye. Oh, you idiotic love boys. Here, give me your hand, Dick. He will be safe. You'll be safe. We'll all be safe if you give me your hand. Ah, so soft. I remember that softness. Go now, Nick, scoot. The sooner he's gone, dear lady, the sooner he'll be back. Shut the door behind him now. I shut the door gently behind him. Rain was falling and the garden was filled with grey shadows. At least, that was what I said to myself. Only shadows. Nothing more frightening than shadows. Why then was I having bother getting my breath? Why was I feeling cold? I turned and looked across the room at the two of them, Dee and the King. He had pulled her right close against him, tight. Both his arms locked round her and a smile on his face that I didn't like at all. Oh, sweet mother of God, what have I done? I turned back to the door, but before I could get it... What have I done? No! Now, sweet mother, pray for us. Oh, mother, I hope you trust. Trust. I trusted him. Oh, dear, sweet mother of Jesus, pray for us. Now. What have you done, you murderer bastard? Let me go home. I must go to him. Nick, Nick. Oh, well, Mary, for the grace, blessed art thou, mother. Enough of your wailing, old woman. He doesn't need prayers any longer. We must calm thee. <laughs> We have to get out of here before the bloody cops get here. Lock that door. We go out the back. Have a car waiting. And for the second time, me playing. The second time. And you must come with us too. Lock that door and bring me over the key. I'll not lock the door for you. No, when I go with you wherever it is that you're going. I trusted you. I never believed those stories they told about you. I swore to myself that you were a good man at heart. And now, look what you done. You've broken her heart. Oh, come here to me, my little darling. Stop that crying, son. Oh, there, 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 my little pet. There, there. Yes, Neil, calm her down. Whisper in her ear. The pain will go. Tell her that. Yeah. She shall have everything she wants. Everything. 
He shall be my queen. Everything that money can buy, we will go wherever she wants to go. See whatever she wants to see. She will be my love. She's always been my love, but he stole her from me. Now all will be well. I promise her that. We'll go away. My plane is waiting for the second time. There, there, calm her now. Soothe her. Rock her like a baby in her arms. My beautiful girl. She'll be happy with me. We'll be so happy. No harm will ever come to her again. No harm? How can you say a thing like that? I am steeped in harm. Drowning in harm. The harm that you've done to me. The terrible harm that you've done to him. Seven years <laughs> I've waited. No one can stay from me and not be punished. They don't call me king for no reason. They don't fear me for no reason. Come, we must go. How do I know you won't shoot me too if I go with you? There's me gun. I would never hold you, my dad. I've never given anyone me gun before. Give me your hand. Neil, you come too. What are you doing, Dee? Don't move. I don't want to shoot you, but I will if you try to stop me. Neil, the door. Don't let her. I opened the door for the poor distracted girl and she ran out into the evening rain. I could hear the sirens of police cars in the distance. I knew what she was going to do, and I thought, Mary, bless her. May God receive her and Nick, and may the pair of them live in this house forever. Traitors! Stop her! She's mine! I've rescued her! Stop her! She's mine! She's mine forever! I brought her back! No one can run away from me! The pain will go, he said. But no, it never will. I pace and pray, pace and pray, pace and pray. Hey Mary, for the grace the Lord is Hey Mary, for the blessed art of our name, Mary. Blessed art of our name, Mary. Blessed art of our name, Mary. Jesus, for the grace of the Lord is Mary. Blessed art of our name, 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 Mary. That was Old Men Are Jealous by Jennifer Johnston. Eileen Colgan played The Old Woman New, and King was played by Ger Carey, Dee was Roxana Neatliam, and Lawrence Kinlan played Nick. The dramaturg was Jesper Bergman. Sound supervision was by Damien Chanel. And the broadcast coordinator was Margaret Hayes. Old Men Are Jealous by Jennifer Johnston, was produced by Kevin Reynolds. The Honeysuckle Smasher, by Noel T. Simpson, Martin, the Smasher, presides at demolition derbies, on inner-city building sites, but behind the Wreckers Ball, and the Sledgehammer style, there's a gentle giant who's a total softy. So how will the awkward bachelor, negotiate the sudden death of his beloved ma'am? Are you okay, pet? I was just parking. I what? I forgot my lunch. Ah, so I did. I know, I, I'm an idiot. Chuck it back in the, in the fridge there. No, don't come into town with it. I know you have free travel, but I need it later. What's that? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm well wrapped up, don't worry. Got me scarf on. Is the heating on? You're nice and cosy. Glad someone is. Yeah, it's going to lash, but I'll be inside me little digger at the controls, don't worry. Just doing an old building here up near Railway Street. No, we've made sure there's no one inside. Yes, the lads have checked to see there are no boards nesting. I told them my mother would be down to bash you all up if you don't check. I, I know you wouldn't, I'm only joking. Did you sleep all right? I heard you up a couple of times. No, no, you didn't disturb me. Are, are you feeling okay, though? 
Too much tea. <laughs> good, good. Are you wearing your panic button? You heard... I know you hate it, but it's important. Just press it if you need to. And don't come into town. All right. Love you too. Bye. Morning, boss. Martin. Ah, lovely to see you too. Look, your buddy's back. I told you. Whatever is he up to? He's chained himself to the railings. He has not. Been here since 6.30 this morning. <laughs> Fair play to him. Good morning, Mr. Lundy. Good morning, Lundy. God love him. This is your fault. Ah, come on now, young buddy. All week he's been loitering around the site talking about the good old days. And of course you have to be all chatty with him. Well, I'll go over and be chatty with him now. Uh, don't worry. In a couple of hours this building will be rubble. It better be. Ah, you can't beat a bit of Glen Campbell, can you, Mr. Lundy? I am not going anywhere. Do you hear me? You lot with your crew of destructive machines. Oh, you'll run dry of diesel before I ever move. Those chains look mighty heavy. You're not sitting on the damp, are you? Go away with your false concern. Oh, you've destroyed enough. This is not right. But sure, this building's been derelict for ages, Mr. Lundy. It- it's had its best years. Oh, that's all you can see. A derelict building. Oh, you grinning idiot. Ah, uh, that, that's a bit mean. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I see, shall I? I see me father's shop front. Paint peeled off and rotten, but still his shop front. We lived above it. Eight of us crammed in. I can still see some of the shelves in there. Can you see them? I won't lie, Mr. Lundy, I, I can't. He had me packing them when I was five. He used to lift me up onto the top shelf whilst my mother would serve the customers. Oh, both of them work so hard. And now their legacy is going to be raised to the ground to make way for another bloody coffee shop. Well, 80 years ago they had to destroy a cattle market to make way for this building. Oh, I know, I know. I just about remember it. Family business too, be all accounts. I'm sure they weren't too chuffed. You just can't wait to get behind the controls of your wrecking ball, can you? One of my first jobs I ever did was demolish the block of flats I grew up in. I dreaded telling me mother I got the gig, but she said it's the people within that give it life. Once they're gone, it's just plain old concrete. Oh, really, really? So tell me something. What's so special about those Georgian houses, huh? Why are they always protected? This has value. Historical value. <coughs> Don't like the sound of that. Huh? At least you can reminisce with the brothers and sisters. Oh, they're all dead. And none of their offspring care about heritage either, pigs. So, you're, you're the last man standing. Oh, oh now, now, I brought me little back up of me folk. Huh? Bang, bang! Uh, uh, put that away, Mr. Lundy. God, you'll get the special branch down here if you're not careful. <laughs> oh, you're not whistling now, are you? It's not loaded, is it? No, the bullets were too heavy. Of course it's loaded! Is that an Enfield number two? Now, how would you know that? My father had one when he was in the army. Where was he stationed? Cattle Brewer. Died in the Congo in 61. Oh. I nearly made it there. The TB got in the way. Lucky man, maybe. Yeah, well, I became the foreman in Cahill Brewer, you know. I used to trigger the sergeant every Friday. I always keep an ear out. Twelve o'clock on the button. <laughs> my mother and I always think of me father. Got be good to him. <coughs> Are you sure that TB's gone? It's going to start lashing in a second. You're going to get soaked to the bone. Uh, I'd imagine this to be much more action-packed with... A bulldozer battling towards me whilst I heroically defend me family's fortress with me service revolver. Well, look, we are better take me warfing. Here, here's the key. Be careful that gun doesn't go off. Will you do me a favour, lad? Wait for me to be well gone before you start, won't you? Of course. Right. 
and I won't ever come back this way again. All right, that's fine. I might be half an hour late. Grant, I have to go. Take care. Yes? Uh, another day, another dollar. Eventful, all right. Job done anyway. That block up in Drimna looks like it's got the go-ahead. Ah, the old Velveteen Cinema. Good stuff. I thought you'd be homeward bound. I just wanted to rack your brains. What's left of them? Sit down there. Ah, oh, oh, that's better. It doesn't sound it, Martin. Yeah. Look, I know I was a bit obstreperous with you on Friday. Apoplectic would be the word I'd use. No one likes to hear they're not needed, Barry. It was an opportunity, not a death knell. I know, I know. A three-day week, that's all I was suggesting. Just something for you to consider. At these advanced years, you mean? I was watching you going over to your friend this morning. You're walking more and more like a gunslinger these days. It nearly turned into the OK Corral at one point. <laughs> Poor fella. But anyway, uh, after much soul-searching, I've, I've decided to accept your offer. Brilliant. Fantastic. When do you want the new terms to kick in next week? Uh, can you try and suppress your joy a little bit? No. I'd retire this second if I could. Another 25 years of being stuck in this porter cabin, surrounded by men in yellow jackets. Good God, you'd be thanking me. <laughs> Would you go away over that? What's brought all this on? I, I just think I've put the body through enough wear and tear over the years. Plus, I have to think of my mother. It's our birthday this week, and sure she's slowing down a bit. Is she all right? Ah, she's fine, thank God. <laughs> and better nick than me. Now, she is prone to falling asleep early in the evenings, and I'd like to get her out and about more. You might as well do it now. How was the cello recital? Well, she enjoyed it. <laughs> That's the main thing. Good. So, three days a week it is, then. But, Martin, you haven't answered the big question. What are you going to do with your extra time? Uh, do you know... I've absolutely no idea. I'm home. The traffic, the traffic. Ah, we got a a sick day kettle on. Oh, good evening, Mr. Posted Note. Don't forget clothing, whatever that means. You up there, ma'am? Ma'am? Has the bulb gone again? Shh. Oh, sorry. What's on? Cavalleria. Oh. Here. I, I best not. Me, me hand's a bit dirty from the... Uh, okay, okay, here's me hand. Oh, ah, yeah. your hand's a bit chilly. Crying. Catch your heart. Catch your heart. <laughs> I'll get the dinner going. We'll, we'll have a nice cup of tea first. Coolio Joe. Uh, hello, Mara. Anne Martin. Are you finally here to demolish the shop? No, you've been spared yet again. Oh, thank goodness. So, are you buying or donating? Or just coming in to see me? Uh, uh, donating. Oh. Where will I put it? Oh, up here will do fine. So, how are you keeping? Uh, great. Uh, it's just some of our ladyship's clothes. Down to business. Let's have a rummage. Uh. She wants to make space in a wardrobe, so good news for your racks and your senior customers. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. No, no, you'd be surprised. The fashion students do be in on the weekend. They snapped up your mother's stuff the last time. The pensioners curse them. Students? Like kids? Yeah, it's called retro, Martin. Have they no modern clothes of their own to wear? Oh, I'm sure they do, but most of them weren't even born in the last century. Oh, some of these clothes must be going back to the 1960s, even earlier. Oh, look at that. Your mother was one classy lady, Martin. She certainly stood out from the crowd. How do you mean? Oh, they're just so colourful and vibrant. Says a lot about her. Uh, no offence meant. No, no, I, I know. 
Are you positive she wants to part with these? Why not? It's a nice excuse for her to buy new clothes and put them in the space she made. <laughs> then in six months' time or so, we'll probably do it all again. Oh, she's definitely a woman of the 21st century. <laughs> my mother always told me that the only thing you get from looking back is a crick in your neck. <laughs> How is she doing? Ah, she's great. It's our birthday this week. Really looking forward to it. You or her? Well, her and, and me, of course. I, I mean... She's very lucky to have a son like you, Martin. Yeah, right. Uh, I better go. Uh, listen, if you find that in the pockets, I'd appreciate you giving the house a call, OK? OK. Uh, tell your mum... I, I will. Cheers, Mara. Take a handy. Yeah. Cheers. From La Boheme, that was Quando Men Vo Soletta, sung by Anna Nitrebka. And I was asked to play that by a Mr. Martin Fogarty, who's on the other line. Martin, are you there, sir? How are you, Kenneth? I'm fine, I'm fine. Oh, my, my, that's noisy. Whatever contraption are you driving in? It's the company car, uh, a JCB. Uh, I'm on the Bluetooth, I promise. A JCB. Well, 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 that's a first for the show. Now, I believe today is a special day for a very special lady. Absolutely. Today is my mother's birthday. And tell me, what's the birthday girl's name? Well, to me, she's ma'am, but to all her friends, she's Polly. Oh, the lovely Pauline, who has indeed been a great friend to this show. And uh, dare I ask, how many candles will be on the cake today? Uh, she's able to vote. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> well, there's no flies on you, sunshine. Well, Pauline, I hope you have a wonderful birthday today. And we'll be sending you out two tickets to the concert hall next month as a no birthday present. Oh, that's very decent of you. And you never know, Martin. She might even let you stay up half an hour late past your bedtime tonight. You know, she listens to you every morning, and even on the podcasts later on. And she's listening to you, her son, right now, Martin. So, would you like to say anything to your mother in front of the nation? Um, uh, I hope you, um, have a great day, ma'am. Um, um... <clears throat> Ring me if you need to. Okay. Well, Martin, drive safely in your JCB, and I hope, Pauline, you have a lovely day where you're spoiled rotten. Happy birthday. And good luck to you too, Martin. Well, that's one flat tire I'd hate to be changing. Now, here's today's competition. Uh, hello, Petal. Greetings from Oil 6. <laughs> My battery's about to go here. Do you want anything? Are you positive? No, no, I know what I want. I'm more interested in what you want. Nothing? Really? I'm passing by some nice oranges here. Oh, you'd like some? I'll get two. O okay, three. And then there's some grapes as well. Hmm? Seedless? Super. I'm approaching the mushrooms. Oh, you might be tempted. In they go. And some toothpaste. Whitening. Hmm. So, apart from fruit and veg, bread, Polish crackers, cereal, Madeira cake, tea bags, tin foil, and more, you need nothing else? Grand. Uh, I'll head for the checkout. I'll be home soon. Are you there? Ma'am? Battery's gone. Ah, I'll get it again. Customer announcement. If there's a Martin Fogarty in the store, your mother called, would you please get two packets of peas and the yogurt she likes? That's Martin Fogarty, two packets of peas and some yogurt. With love, your ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you little beauty. I'm a bit knackered without those details, Mick. Can you try to get them over to me? Great stuff. Martin, 
Well, he's fine. I haven't seen him this morning, which is a bit peculiar for him. Actually, he's on the other line. He must have heard us. I'll let you go, Mick. Thanks. About ringing me on the landline. What are you doing still at home? Martin? Martin, you all right? Oh, my God. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. Your poor man. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming here to say goodbye to Pauline, my mother. The first object I ever demolished was a brick wall out in the fields next to us. I must have been five or six. My mother never liked me running around and playing soldiers with the other kids. After my father died, it it was no game to her. But she knew I had to let off steam somehow. So she got a sledgehammer from somewhere and the two of us spent a lovely afternoon smashing up this great big brick wall. And for a delicate lady, she had quite the swing. So, my destructive career path has all been her fault. Blame her. My mother would not want today to be a sad day, even though it is, if that makes sense. She had great humility and never liked to complain, as she would remind me that there was always someone worse off. She taught me to be grateful for what you had in life. And I stand here today very grateful for my mother having been on this earth for as long as she was. And although I'll miss her, she's gone to be with my father now. And and that makes me very, very happy. So, back to Bourne's for a few drinks and, and some good company. Thank you. Ah, she had a great long life, and I like to think it was a happy one. (laughs) Always had a smile on her face. I'm sure she let me know when I'm up there with her. (laughs) Listen, uh, you're very good for coming today. Martin, sorry to interrupt. I'm going to hit the road. Are you off? Yep. Taxi's outside. Listen, I know you, but do me a favour. Take next week off. (laughs) He's great, this fella. (laughs) No, seriously, as a favour to me. No, actually, as your employer. Yeah, as your employer, which I am. That's an order. Well, me mam always told me to respect me elders, whether they be in age or pay grade. Your mum, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm devastated for you. Ah, yeah, you're very good. We all know she meant the world to you, Martin. And beyond, but as I was saying to Patsy here, she had a good long life and I was very lucky to have a, a man like her. Now, you go and get your taxi. Okay. I, I don't want to see you Monday or next week, in fact. Yes, so. But do text. Uh, you don't text. R- r- ring me if you need to. Go on, you mad thing. Save hope. Does anyone want another point? Do you want a cup of tea, pet? No? Okay. Time for the labber. Where are you hiding? Good night, ma'am. Love you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I should be able to drop them in at six and fly by at eight, yeah. The grand stuff. Listen, I better go. I have a troublemaker here, yeah. Yeah, you too, Helen. Take care. Bye. Always on the phone. Don't you know? Come here to me. Good to see you too, boss. <sighs> That's me back on again. You sit down there. I was strolling around town. Thought I'd pop in. Worried that standards have dropped in your five-day absence. I have to keep you lads on your toes. <laughs> Any word in Drimna? Drimna? The block with the cinema... The Velveteen? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Listen to him, maybe. I don't want you coming in till at least a week after I told you that. Now, uh, don't be like that. Well, seriously, the minute you come back here, you're just going to bury yourself in work when you should be... What's that? Is that your guitar case? It is. I just bought it this morning. Here. 
Have a gander. She's lovely, isn't she? Give us an old go there. Listen to that. Brought this. this morning? I, I didn't know you could play. Ah, uh, Dad got me a guitar when I was in Nipper. Started off enjoying it, but I couldn't get a handle on it. But I decided it was best to stop that for I smashed it off my wardrobe. Uh, that there is quite expensive. If you can contain any orge, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> you brought this for yourself? Yeah. You seem terribly surprised. Well, I never thought you was being musical. Ah, it was always in the back of my head. So I had no patience either, plus my fingers were too pudgy. But she caught me eye in the shop window, and the neck is the perfect wit. I'm getting lessons from the young lad who sold it to me. Fair play. <laughs> it was funny. He warned me that my fingers will hoard from playing because they're probably, he said, too soft. <laughs> Big mistake. But he assured me they would develop calluses. Yeah. And I said, look at these hands, lad. These are nothing but two joint calluses. It's the strings you need to feel sorry for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you love teaching you. Ah, he's a nice kid. Don't think he's old enough to vote. Good. So, how are you getting on? The the house must feel different without your mum being there. Uh, Yeah, it does. Uh, Tell Helen thanks for the card. Well, she'd love to see you. Are you sleeping okay? Me? Like a log. I might drop up, actually. You do that? How about Thursday, then? No, I I can't. I'm starting Italian next Thursday. If I missed the first class, I'd be a bit knackered. Italian? Yeah. You're learning a language as well as the guitar. You see? I'm keeping busy. That That's good, isn't it? <laughs> it's fantasticissimo. <laughs> Why Italian, though? The language school's right beside the guitar shop, I thought. What the heck? <laughs> right. I must say, I'm delighted you're embracing semi-retirement so warmly. Ah, look, I can do all that stuff at night. Might as well come back here again, you know? Full time, Yeah. I was waiting for this. She wouldn't want me moping around, dwelling. I need... I want to walk, Barry. That's the type of breed I am. I'll take a wage call. It's not about money. But my dad was going to do everything when he retired. Plenty of time when I retire, son. It didn't happen, of course. I know it's hard to believe, Martin, but there's more to life than concrete. I won't do any overtime or weekend work. Just five days, clock in, clock out. I'm not happy about this, really. But I know myself the value of having a steady routine, okay? We'll look at it again, though, in six months. Sounds fair. Thank you, young Barry. There she goes. So the week after next, okay? That's ideal. I'm getting stuff together at home anyway. I must get Eddie's truck. I'm going to send some furniture to the charity shop. Are you sure? Is it not a bit soon? No better time than now. No need to rush things either. Relax. This is the smasher you're talking to. No situation gets the better of me. <laughs> what are you laughing at? What did you always tell me back when I was your apprentice? Master your trade. Oh, your trade will master you. Yeah, that's the one. You can't master this trade, Martin. I wasn't the same man after Dad died. I never will be. Anyway, uh, we'll give it a lash. Good to see you, Barry, and... Uh, thanks. Ah, here's Martin to brighten my day. Uh, hiya, Mara. I thought that was you. Still driving that green Morris Marina? Uh, a bit heavy. Uh, up on the counter? Are uh, you sure? Yeah. Ah, oh, sugar. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have been quicker. Ah, uh, not to worry. Just clothes. Throw them up loose. Let me help. More of your mam's clothes? Yeah. Nearly the last. I should really bar you. I'd hate for her to regret giving these away. Now, that's it. Uh, just to say to you, my mother passed away last Friday. Oh, my God. I know, she died peacefully in her sleep. The old heart. Martin, I'm so sorry. She was very happy all her life, you know. She'd have been the first one to tell you that. God, I just can't believe it. I, I hadn't seen her much these past few years, but she was always such a lovely woman. Oh, I'm raging I didn't hear about it. I would have been there. Uh, not to worry. She had a great send-off. Priest said a few nice words. Lovely bit of singing, and that was that. And what about you? How are you coping? Uh, never noticed how loud the plumbing was at home until now. <laughs> What's that smell? What smell? I know it. 
I don't get it. it. It's from your jumper. Me? Did you have a casserole last night? I always have one on a Monday. With red wine? That's what it is. Oh, yes. Ugh, is it that bad? The last time my mother and I had a casserole was when Pope John Paul died. <laughs> she was a bit upset. Don't think we've ever had one again. Strange. My tumble dryer's broken. I just threw on what I had this morning. Anyway, um, I'm back to work tomorrow, so I just thought I'd, I'd get rid of this stuff. Stuff? Oh, yeah. Look, I think you should hang on to these for the moment. See how you are in a month. What for? Well, it's a bit soon, don't you think? Ah, she was on a mission to give them away eventually. <laughs> She'd haunt me if I didn't. I'll tell you what. I'll put these to one side out of the way for a fortnight, and if you change your mind... No, less of the fussing, please. My mother hated fussing. Martin, I saw you drive past the window three times in the last half hour. Now, don't be silly. These aren't second-hand clothes anymore. You see? But I couldn't get parking. I'm blocking the chipper next door. Listen, just stick them in the rack, if you would. It'd be nice to know she's still helping someone, in a way. Mind yourself, Maura. Martin... Martin. Martin Love. Some of which we all know about. Others are just plain bizarre. But that's the canals for you. Okay, it's going to be mild today, but perhaps rain for the rest of the week. Strong emphasis on the word perhaps. Right then, here's a bit of Glenn Campbell with Wichita Lineman. Maybe another time, Glenn. Yeah, I know. You miss her too. Watch out! Stop talking around you and watch where you're going. You stupid fucking idiot. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought I saw someone. Yes, uh, the light's green. Thank you. Ah, uh, look at her. The old Velveteen Cinema. God, the family tried to keep her open as long as they could. Did you spot someone outside? I saw them, the poor devils. And don't forget their campaigner friends waving their placards. They got about 3,000 signatures. Really? Yeah. Jamie Mac. And where were the mighty 3,000 when this place was open? Around the corner at the shiny new multiplex, which made this place look a little tatty. Of course, tatty soon becomes charming. They've no one to blame but themselves. Good to see you in fine fettle anyway. Ah, that sort of carry on annoys me. My mother insisted on coming here right up to its last days. Yeah. She always brought me here when I was a boy. You know, young Freddy is dying to have a go at the controls if you want to do something else. Not at all. What are they going to put here again, anyway? Student accommodation. Education. Good. My chariot awaits. Ah, did you miss me? Are you sure you're okay about this? I am. Would you stop? It's like riding a bike. God, I remember the owner, Mr. Dappling. He'd greet you in the lobby with his red velvet tunic on. He'd split the ticket straight down the middle with his white gloves like that. Okay, well... Ah, I, I, uh, you could sit where you want. We had our little spot. Crisps and ice cream, that was the menu. <laughs> I'd fall asleep with my head against her arm. She had one particular coat that the second I lent me head against it, boom, oh, out for the coat. It was that soft. What was that material again? Anyway, and then I'd wake up after missing most of the film and she'd say, let's stay and watch it all again. <laughs> right. Release the Kraken. Remind yourself. God, I knew this was a bad idea. Forward motion, Martin. Forward motion. What the hell? Everything all right, Martin? Did the lads not check? Check what? Such a basic thing. What's the problem? Look. Top right. There's a nest. I can't see it. I, are you looking? The lads checked, Martin. They'd know you go ballistic. I saw two boards flying in. They're up there. Okay, okay, I'll get Freddy to check it out. Right. While they're doing that, I'll, I'll be back in an hour. Where are you going? I'm just an errand to run. I need to borrow transport. 
Where are you? Where are you? Martin? Oh, how are you? Uh, I didn't think you were in today. I had to swap. You know what the men's rack is over there. Will you hold these for me? Uh, sure. You have these priced very cheap. Has everything been put out? Oh, Sheila put them all out. I stuck a note on the box saying not to, but I'm sorry. It's not your blend. I'm just really looking for one coat in particular. Which one? It's rare you'd find cashmere in these places. Cashmere? That's it? Oh, no, not her. It's nice, actually, if a bit tatty. I have a seamstress who can do a job for me, get the hem taken up and maybe remove that ghastly collar. No wonder it was thrown out. Now, you'll do me a bargain, won't you? As one of your loyal customers, you should really have loyalty cards. Excuse me, love. Madam. Sorry to interrupt, but there's been a mistake. That coat should never have been put out. I beg your pardon? There was a mix-up. I have to take it back. Oh, now, I've heard stories like this. Staff keeping the good stuff for themselves. Listen, you... Uh, that... the, the coat belongs to my mother. Uh, it's my fault. Sorry for the confusion. But I was so looking forward to wearing it. And it's lovely and warm also. I'll pay you 50 euro. No, you won't. 60, and it's yours. Done. Tenors, if you could. Here you are. Apologies again. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Oh, thank you. And here's your coat, love. There was a bit of a smell off it anyway. Nice doing business. Ta-ta. Is that your JCB double parked across the road? Uh, it is. Uh, I better go. Oh, right then. I'll hang these other ones back up. Uh, actually, uh, I might take them as well. Take two. Hello, Martin. Do you read me? I hear you loud and clear. The structure is nest-free now, I take it. Yes, Martin. Well spotted first time. We'll crack on. Sounds good to me, boss. In your own time. Everything all right? Yeah, just uh, getting comfortable. Okay. Right then. Here goes. Twelve o'clock. Oh, Martin. Are you okay? Bang on midday. <laughs> Those lads in the barracks are something. Will we let Freddy have a go? It was cashmere. That was the name of the material. Remember I was telling you about how cold and me falling asleep on our arm? Cashmere. Did I tell you she used to come here with me dad before I was born? I'd sometimes see her wiping her eyes. <laughs> she said it was the movie, but thinking about it... You just don't cry at cartoons and John Wayne. Hello, can I help? Huh? What? Are you all right, Pauline? Where's that coming from? It's me, Pauline. It's Paul. Do you need help? Paul who? You pressed your panic button, my dear. Oh, so I have. Sorry. Uh... Is that you, Pauline? No, it's Martin, her son. Oh, good evening, Mr. Fogarty. Is your mother all right? Uh, what's your name again? My name is Paul, sir, from Comfort Alarms. I see the red light flashing, um... Paul, my mother is... She passed away about two weeks ago. Oh, Mr. Fogarty, I, I, I'm so deeply sorry. Yes, so am I. May I ask when it happened? Uh, Friday a week ago, I think. Yeah, uh, Friday. She died in her sleep. Friday. That would be the 23rd. I spoke to her the day before. She pressed the button by accident. You spoke to her? Yes. It's logged in my computer. 3.53 p.m. She was a lovely woman. I'm so sorry. Am I supposed to know when she activates the button? Oh, no, no. Not when it's by accident. She would sometimes do that and apologize profusely and we'd end up having a chat. A chat? Yes. Not just with me. She was quite popular here with all the staff. They'll be devastated when I tell them. 
And what would she talk about? Oh, she loved opera, art, poetry. She loved writing and drawing. We had so much in common. Really? Oh, she told me so much about you. Yeah? Uh, go on, then. Uh, what did she say? Well, she said... No, uh, no, no, don't. Uh, that's unfair to me to ask. Uh, go on, you, you better get going. Well, I was just about to go, but I, I saw the alarm activated. I'm off to Italy tomorrow on my holidays. I believe you brought her there. Well, we went together many times. She loved it. We both did. The last time we were there, we, we saw the Sistine Chapel. Oh, magnificent, isn't it? Oh, mind-blowing. The way they vaulted that roof was genius. The use of pendentives and spandrels. Phenomenal stuff. They didn't do a bad job of painting the ceiling, either. <laughs> yeah, that was the bit she liked. Michelangelo, uh, am I right? Ten points, Mr Fogarty. You see, I do know something. I'm going through the big trunk full of paper in the room. Uh, all drawings and writing and poetry. Did she ever read you some of her poetry? Now and again. She even read me one about you. Me? Did she not... Uh... She may have. Uh, I just mightn't have realised. Oh, it was lovely. Listen, I'm delaying you now. No, no, hang on now. Did she ever sound sad to you? Look, Mr. Fogarty, I, I'm sorry for your loss, but I don't think it's my place. Well, by the sounds of a pal, you and Pauline seem to be a right old double act. You even sound like one. We only spoke four or five times over the two years. Did she ever sound sad to you? I'm reading stuff here and I can't tell if it's supposed to be sad or not. I'll let you go free after this, I, I promise. To me, she was a very happy person. Ah, that's good to hear. But also thoughtful and introspective. And when you're that way inclined, sometimes even beautiful things make you sad. Why? Why would they? I can't get my head around that. You don't have to get your head around it, sir. Ah, uh, I don't know. And how are you, Mr. Fogarty? You should be careful drinking at home. Well, Paul, on the way home tonight, I popped into the pharmacist and got me some extract of honeysuckle. I'm having extract of honeysuckle with some whiskey. Are you coming down with the flu? Never had the flu in my life. No, in the olden days, hundreds of years ago, honeysuckle was used to treat a particular disease. Are you okay? Oh, it's a disease of the mind, Paul. It's called nostalgia. Nostalgia? Looking back at things fondly? Yep. Used to be quite prevalent among soldiers. Extract of honeysuckle was the way my dad dealt with it, so Mam said. Your dad was in the army, I believe? Yeah. Died in the Congo in 1961. I was barely a year old. That's terrible. Does the honeysuckle work? Only started taking it tonight. Never had to before now. Lately I keep noticing things. Things I've never caught before. Places I've driven by all my life. Even insignificant stuff. Names on a napkin or the side of a truck. All reminders me ma'am. My mother. I keep hearing music on the radio she liked as if they're waiting for me to turn it on at that exact moment. And smells. <laughs> and then there are the imposters. People who look like her from afar. I nearly ran someone over the other day because I was staring across the road. And as for getting rid of stuff... I... That's no disease or infection. You're reaching out for anything that reminds you of her. You're realising how much she was part of you. I never took her for granted. I'm sure you didn't. She was always strong whenever me dad's name came up. At least that's how she acted with me. Well, isn't that a parent's job? To look strong? Yeah. I'll be good to her. You know, I think that's the first time I've said that. God be good to her. I don't think this honeysuckle is working. Hmm. Perhaps the whiskey is counteracting its intention. Probably. Janie, you've had to suffer the other end of the conversational spectrum tonight, you poor chap. Not at all. It's been a pleasure. But my mother, 
It was all introspection and the mysteries of the human soul. I'm afraid with me there's tumbleweed rolling through. Who was asking me about a tumble dryer? You know, in your own unique way, you sound very introspective to me, Mr Fogarty. You just don't seem to be too comfortable with it. No. No, I, I don't like it. I like structure. Laws of physics. This is intangible. Is that the word? There's a giant massive sinkhole after appearing, and I, I don't know how to fill it up. Not with guitar lessons or Italian, anyway. A huge vat of polyfiller might do the trick. Oh, please don't start mixing whiskey with polyfiller, Mr Fogarty. God, no. Not with whiskey, anyway. I let you go. I, I can't remember. Paul is my name. No, I, I know that, Paul. Silly. Uh, I can't remember that song from the opera. She played it many times. Did she ever mention it to you? She liked Maria Callas. Does uh, O Mio Babino Caro ring a bell? How many songs is that? Just the one, sir. No. No, I, I should have paid more attention. I'll ask St. Anthony. She always did. I believe he's a good man at finding lost things. I'm sure it'll come to you. Tumbleweed. <laughs> Tumble dryer. Good night, Mr. Fogarty. I've had to go next door to get the clothes dried. It's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> I'll put your tea there. Thanks. I left the bag in it, as requested. Thank you. I think maybe the limit switch is gone on this. Oh. It's a safety precaution. Hard to get at. Ah. Come here to me, uh... You've had this a while? Martin, look, I feel like I'm talking to the tumble dryer. Get your head out of there and have your tea. I think I nearly have it. It's getting cold. Come on, I slaved for a whole minute over this. I think I know what the problem is. Oh, me back. I'm getting on. No guitar with you? Uh, it's back at the ranch. It's quite sore on the fingers, actually. And how is life on the ranch? Ah, it's fine, you know. Just getting on with it. Keeping, Keeping the, the best, best side, side out. out. <laughs> what? You always say that. Chin up, stay strong, head down. You asked? Uh, I asked out of concern, not chit-chat. And I am getting on with it. it. It must be difficult in the house. Not just the house. She's not on the other end of the phone anymore. Or sitting across from me when we're out and about having a cup of tea or... Next to me in the car. Will that do you, Inspector? I miss my ma'am every day, Martin. She bought that piece of rubbish. Every day. Have you had the dream yet where you think it's all been a big mistake and she's still alive, sleeping in the room next to you? I had mine again last night. And in the dream, I couldn't wait to see my ma'am and give her a great big hug and tell her how much I loved her. And then I woke up. Have you had that dream, Martin? No, is the answer to your question. I do sometimes wonder, though, whether this whole thing is some kind of dream. <sighs> Are you OK? Yeah. Just to let you know... Uh, my mother never wanted me to drop donations into anyone else but you. She told me to check before going in. If Maura's is not there, forget it. Did she really say that? <laughs> she did. Oh, that's sweet. It was a bloody nuisance. There were other places much closer and on a weekday as well. But she who must be obeyed. You've gone from complimenting me to insulting me all in the space of five seconds. It's my talent. <laughs> I demolish things. Now, I think we might be back in action. Switch on there, please. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. Let it run for a bit. See that it stays on. Oh, look, thanks a million for dropping by. Yeah, thanks for the tea. You're welcome. 
suppose there's no reason for you to be coming into the shop anymore. Ah, I'll be in at some point in the future, but not for a while, I suspect. I'm sure you've a mate you can talk to, but if he's not around, then you know you can talk to me. I, I know you won't, but just saying. Right. Uh, that's very good of you, Mara. But I think I'll be fine. I, I'm off to the concert hall next week. Oh, the concert hall's lovely. Yeah. She got two tickets off the radio, so I'm going to go along. Who's on? I think I saw Mozart written somewhere. God, haven't been there in ages. That sounds great. I mean, really great. Uh, if, if you want to go. Yes? I'm sure they still have tickets available. Oh, right. I'll check it out. Do. And sure, if you want a lift, give us a shout. I will, Martin. Mind yourself, Marta. Cheers for the tea. No problem, Martin. Cheers, you big idiot. Those flower women know how to charge the gate coming in. Still can't get over the big chief telling me we're closed, bud, sorry, after me buying them. <laughs> Good thing I didn't bring me bulldozer. Ah, look at that. I ripped me jacket up and over the wall. <laughs> I must learn to sew. You were always good at that. <sighs> it's nice fresh air. It's gonna rain. So, the sun, huh? There it is. Starting to go down. You have a nice front view, haven't you? Only the best. I'm glad it's keeping you company. Still can't remember what that piece of music was. St. Anthony hasn't weighed in yet. If you see him, tell him he's brutal. I've been listening to your stuff and it's, it's okay, actually. Some of those opera singers can hold a note. Told you, the rain doesn't seem to dampen the sun. Be God, it's powerful, isn't it? But not too blinding. Red sky at night, shepherds delight. And the clouds, they complemented it. Isn't that the word, pet? I miss you. Just thought I'd say that. Uh, do you mind if I go? I don't want to push me luck. Not looking forward to climbing back up that wall again. We might do a sunrise next time. I'll bring a ladder. The sun's just on its last embers now. Tell that I said hello. I hope he's keeping well. What was that, Jonah? Anyway, uh, I'll see you over the weekend. I know I don't just have to come here to see you. Sh sure, I see you everywhere. Love you, ma'am. Take care. <laughs> 